Welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 509, with the Mr. Flint Dilly. And let me tell you, this is one heck of an interview. Uh, Flint was one of these guys that was there. He seems to always be in the room when all the great stuff was happening. You know, he's there at TSR working with Gary Gygax. He's worked on Transformers, G.I. Joe, Transformers the movie, bunch of games. He's written a bunch of books. I mean, the list just goes on and on. <laughs> you know, I sat across a desk from George Lucas. Uh, I mean, he's like he knows everybody, knows everything, but uh, if you're like me and you're one of those as a kid and you couldn't wait for Saturday morning to roll around so you could pop out of bed, race to the couch, and turn on uh, the Saturday morning cartoons, I think in particular you'll be thrilled about this, this interview. But really, this, this covers a lot of stuff. Uh, anyway, we got a whole bunch of things to talk about, as you'll see, so without further ado, here is Mr. Flint Dilly. All right, folks, I am here with none other than Flint Dilly. Hey, he's how's it going? Screenwriter, game designer, novelist. He's probably, if you're anything Spider-Man like me. Spider-Man taker at the moment, yeah. If you're anything like me, this, this man is responsible for a large part of probably your favorite memories growing up. I mean, Transformers, uh, you know, that would be enough for me, but there's so much more. G.I. Joe, he's done a couple of books. Just finished your Games Master book. Highly. Oh, you read that? Yeah. It was, did you have fun with it? Did I have fun with it? Well, we'll see. <laughs> We're going to be diving. Okay, good. No, it's fantastic. Yeah, I got to write one of another era because you, you just get frozen in an era. And like kind of what happened next was just as interesting. But, you know, it's. Yeah, it feels like it needs a sequel. That's for a different day. I also got a book called The Ultimate Guide to Video Game Writing and Design. That's right. Working on the sequel to that now with John Platten. I mean, it's really funny. We did that in 2008. And, you know, and then, you know, after that, went off to Blizzard and, you know, worked on Diablo 3. And I think Uncharted was somewhere around there. Um, and then went to Niantic and did uh, Ingress and Pokemon Go and, you know, came back and then and was working on a Sony, uh, uh, an unannounced uh, title for the Sony PlayStation. And I thought, oh, you know, I, everything we wrote in that book is going to be totally obsolete. And what I found out is it actually wasn't. I mean, about half of it Aristotle would have agreed with. But, you know, game storytelling, certainly in mainstream games, has not advanced much. Indie games is a different story. But I just look at these, uh, these books are, of course, on Amazon. Both have near-perfect ratings. Yep. Yeah, uh, Noel, yeah, I bribed a lot of people. <laughs> Yeah, the ultimate guide. I, yeah, just to finish this, the games master, my life in the 80s geek culture trenches. <laughs> uh, okay, that, that title, I once again, so in both much. books, that, the, the games master is my title because I crowdsourced it off of uh, Facebook. Oh, is that, I thought it was like a little play because you talk in there about how the life is like a game and you know, oh, yeah, it's a double play on it, but I, I just crowdsourced it, and that was also the name of a Joe script I wrote yeah, that the, kind of summed up that period. Um, <laughs> and also, I was doing games, and, and yeah, just all kind of fit together. But and I can't remember who came up with that, and I should properly credit them, but I, I can't just can't remember. That's a good title. Yeah, we watched the, that episode, I watched it with my wife actually the other day. It's like, well, I should probably sit down and watch some G.I. Joe to kind of get uh revved up for this. And I always uh, I kind of eat. You know, you know, I don't know what it's like for you, but for me, when I go back and watch something from my childhood, you never quite know if it's going to live up to like your memories because you, in your mind, it was like the best thing ever. You never do. And it's always a little scary and it feels really great when it does. <laughs> and it feels, you know, it's like when it doesn't, you just kind of go, oh, well, you know, I was a kid. That, I mean, a lot of most of the time I can I can see what it was I liked about it. Yeah, it's you know, a great episode. Just, uh, you know, a lot you know decades later, you know, you're not the same person. You know, it, it it's it, it is the same river. You're not the same. You know, you're not. Why is like, Why is there the Baroness in a bikini? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, the whole. Like, the hey, it was a better the, time back then. They knew what boys wanted back then. Yeah. Well, I mean, what was funny was that you know that 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 script it was interesting from the point of view that I only really wrote GI Joe episodes defensively. In other words, like when a script had fallen out, I say I think I say that in the book, but 
you know, in other words, like I was a story editor and a producer and, and all that. So, uh, you know, I didn't really have time to write scripts and that's not what they wanted me doing. But then we, uh, something would go wrong. Some writer couldn't deliver the script or we got something in that was like, it was easier to start over than to, to do the script or, you know, for whatever reason. And so then it would always be like in a 48 hour period, we'd go from premise to full script. And that was true of the Games Master, Skeletons in the Closet, No to Cobra. Yeah, No to Cobra. Well, you know, I think you made a good point. A lot of this, I think everybody should read this book. You know, you got the nostalgia factor. Because I was, you know, I was the kid that you were doing all this for. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, I grew up a lot of Transformers. I remember that, you know, so you got all that going on, which makes it fun to read. But you're like on the other side of this you know producing it and get the right like, with the business side of it and it's just like all oh, this stuff i had no idea you just completely blew my mind and there's like seven or eight places in this book where you know i grew up with this stuff and i never put two and two together you know and i never oh that's funny <laughs> well because you're seeing it from a totally different perspective you know what i mean it's like with gi joe when i was working on it we had episodes we could watch and that was through transformers but like a lot of the characters, you know, I'd never actually seen the characters. What I had was a black and white line drawing. And that was especially true of Transformers. We had to have a chart. I'd love to have a copy of that. But it, we, uh, we had to have a chart that uh, had their comparative sizes next to them. Because, you know, if you, you were careful, you're writing, you know, some, you know, character that's this big talking to one that's this big. And that, you know, that's a whole staging issue. At a certain point, we just decided not to worry about that. But. Yeah, speaking of the games master, that happens when he stands up in the in the chair. You're like, "Whoa, this guy's huge!" Yeah, no, well, yeah. I mean, in that script, okay, you know, you know, uh, um, the Baroness in a bikini and all that stuff. That script was like Jay's instruction on that. You know, we just said, "Okay, we need we need a script in 48 hours." And Jay said, "But just do something where it's like different, where you don't blow up the headquarters at the end." I mean, that was the 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 artistic ambition of that script is don't blow up the headquarters. And, um, uh, you know, so, you know, it, it started there and I was, I wrote it in the, at the Dungeon and Dragon mansion. That was the other funny thing about it. And, you know, I'm sitting there with sand tables and games all around me and, and all that. So, and it was, it was just kind of fun to, you know, to sort of have those worlds cross for a while, which was also true of, of uh, Skeletons in the Closet. I mean, it's basically a Lovecraft story that just happened to be in G.I. Joe. I thought one of the, you know, you talk a lot in here about the creation process and writing and the, the process side of it. And I thought one of the most interesting things, I really related to it, was in you were saying that, I think it was your rhetoric professor, Larry Green, professor, yeah. you know, basically said, it's fine to work really fast, you know, because that way you avoid the overthinking. And it seems like I had the same experience writing papers in college. I got a lot of my best papers. I got like the best grades were ones I literally like forgot the deadline. I'm like, oh crap, I got to write this thing, you know, quick. And you got all that pressure and it just somehow you focus and you get it done. It forces you to get past any blocks, you know, because no matter who, who you are and when you're writing, you're going to at times feel blocked, you know, or you're like, ah, oh, should I do this or should I do that? Well, when you got to have it in at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, those questions all go away and you just do it. And probably the absolute best papers would be you write them in a in a flurry. And that was one of the bad things about college papers is, but you should get do a second draft. Yeah, I think a lot of my college papers would have been really great because all of a sudden I got it, I you know, and all that. But it, you do have to craft things. And when you're turning it in at nine o'clock in the morning after having you know finished it at 8.15, um you know uh you're you're not you don't walk in with a polished piece of work but you do walk in with focused ideas and just chuckling a little bit because you talked about how you were doing all this on your i think it was a deck mate yeah deck mate too a lot of times you'd have to retype things but that was a fine thing. and i've had the same experience it's a little bit different what would happen to me i'd write a draft i thought was pretty good but then my zip disc or my disc that i had it on would screw up and i wouldn't be able to retrieve it so I'd have to like rewrite it again, but it would it, somehow it turned out better because yep. like you say, you, you, if you're typing it again, you don't, you're not going to bother retyping all the crap. Yo, yeah. Well, yeah. That was, that was Jim Boyle <laughs> talking about that. That was, a, uh, good advice. I, I, it's like I had the thought, but it wasn't yeah. as well, never been as well expressed as that. Yeah, no, that, but it's true because I mean, that's one of the problems what we have now is you're not forced to retype it. You know, back in typewriter days, you were forced to retype it. 
And probably as a discipline exercise for writers, you should force yourself to retype it, your your, your final draft. Because then all the stuff, you find all these vestigial things in there that, you know, in a word process, you're not going to catch it, you know, or if you don't have to go over it, you don't see it. Uh, the other thing I've been doing lately is, is you know, hitting the thing where it, it reads the the script to you. Oh, yeah. Reads the, the book to you or whatever, and that works too. Well, it's a, I wanted to, there's a couple, so many quotes in this that I want to get into, but there was one that I just, it really struck me. You know, because this book, I, I would say, is kind of bittersweet. Oh, really? Yeah, you got your successes, but that's what I like about it. I don't want to sit there and read a book about, oh, yeah, and then I did this, and it was great, and then I did this, and it was great. And it's like there's no, you know, pushback, or there's no uh, doubt. Right. Uh, but anyway, this is the quote, and this, I, don't, I didn't write down the page number. It doesn't matter. Read the book, folks. Uh, but you're talking here, you say, it will never be 1985 again. But it would sure be great if we could drag some of 1985 into the 2020s. Man, I just—I think, I think everybody <laughs> agrees with me on that. I've never had anybody say, "Oh no, we don't want the 80s back." <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, I, I, it's, I, no I, I've never had anybody disagree with that statement. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you, know, you know, like I say, I was a kid then. You know, watching all this in my mind, it was like the best years ever. You know. The, totally click with me but, but what you know what makes you say that you're kind of on the productive side of this is is that much i mean obviously a lot has changed but just, just from your perspective it's gotten a lot worse would you say well i mean okay i mean you know i was not that much more than a kid at that point you know i'm probably when the story starts i'm 25 right you know so i mean it's not yeah i'm not nine but i mean you know it's it's <laughs> like you know you know it's i wasn't my dotage now and so uh, you know, I think so a certain amount of it is, yes, you are looking back on lost youth. And of course, that's oh, always going to be, you know, literally nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're wishing for a world that didn't exist. And the, the whole purpose in writing that book was I wanted to write about a, a golden age, you know, and it's something that, and it, it came out of like, I had 140 pages of where, you, you know, in the Internet before we routinely use Zoom you know, where people would ask, you know, send you print it, you know, you know, take questions, you'd answer them and, you know, type the answers. And so I decided I would just put this all in a book and that way I'll have it all written down and I won't have to answer these questions anymore. And of course, it doesn't work that way, but, you know, that was the thought. And, and I figured I just thought I should write this all down. And I was feeling, you know, as I said, in the beginning of the book, it was like, I'm sitting in Paris in this apartment. I find this document with like 140 pages of questions and answers, which tells you what your audience you know, wants to know and we we're waiting for the new game to came come out you know like you know it's like either it's going to be a big success or you know we're, our company's over and uh so it's no kind of this no pressure well yeah exactly yeah well the game was pokemon go so it worked out but you know yeah you know, you know it it you know once again you, you know success and failure are fascinating things you know because sometimes it's, it's hard to manage success as it is to manage failure um, and, but anyway, so that was the moment in life when I started, I said, I really write this a book. And then I write little sections and post them on Facebook and people respond. So, so it was a very much a, you know, it was just something to do. You know, it wasn't like my main project until COVID at, at which time, okay, I'm locked up. I have a book deal. I got to finish this. And it was an absolute perfect project for that period in life to, you know, finish the book. Um, yeah, but yeah, I was trying to write about, so I'm writing it from this really bleak, dark period where we're locked up in this winter where it seemed to rain every day and was, you know, gloomy and you know, we all thought we were going to die in 10 minutes and all that. Remember, the, the, I mean, I finished, the last meeting I had with anybody before lockdown was with my editor. And uh, um, so uh, obviously it's pretty easy to look back nostalgically on, oh, <laughs> it's bright and sunny and you're 25 and, and you know, the, you know nobody's sick and there's not a global pandemic. None of that's happening, right? So that's part of it. Part of it is, is that it really was a great period. Mm -hmm. And I, I decided in there, I'm not saying anything bad about anybody in this book because this book isn't about, you know, I've seen some of those documentaries about you know, Masters of the Universe or guys are getting, you know, going in 13 rounds over who created, you know, P-Man's God piece or, you know, whatever the argument is, right? Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, uh, you know, it, except for Casey Kasem, I just didn't say anything. And what was funny was I didn't remember anything bad. 
I, and I, I, I thought I didn't have my journal from those days because remember that's what's known as the digital black hole, right? And mm -hmm. you know when we all had you know weird computers that you know that like the companies no longer exist and the discs don't work, but it turns out I printed it all out and I found it afterwards. And it was shockingly accurate. I was amazed at how just mentally and through talking to people and stuff like that, you were able to reconstruct, you know, the you know, memories in order. And then I had everybody who I still still know, who's still around, read it. And they, they'd have ideas and suggestions. And, you know, I, I, nobody had anything where they said, oh, you totally lied about that or, uh, um, you know, take that out. Tom, Tom Griffin, I, I didn't like him. I referring to the three martini lunches in New York. So I took that out. But um and, and he was never had he and joe were never doing the three martini lunches but it was like old ad executives you know well, it's probably good for your mental health that if you're going to be forgetful about something it's sure good to forget the negative stuff <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's just yeah because well, it didn't I dwell on it, man. it's not going to help any no you can't change it and it didn't matter and that's what i was saying well, yeah when i found my actual journal there's plenty of bad stuff first of all it would have been of no interest to the readers and second of all, you know, it's like just the passing ephemera. It gives you a sense when you do something like that of what's important and what's not. There's a, there's a you know, a few stories in there that definitely had <laughs> kind of stunning, you know, the stuff that, that went on, especially at the, that mansion you're talking about. Oh, yeah. That was a wild, wild ride. Yeah, I like this. Uh, this I think it was Jack Kirby. I mean, this is another one of those. Uh, I kept thinking of that six degrees. Is it six degrees of separation? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, like, Kevin Bacon. Talks, talking to you, I'm like, like my uh, nodes have just exploded because now I'm like a degree separated from all kinds of people. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah, I like this. Uh, I think it's Jack Kirby, and he comes on and says, "What? When? When is the golden age of comics?" You remember that? And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That wow. was his, that was his big joke. Yeah, yeah when's wow. the golden age of comics? And I'm sitting there, you know, because I wasn't like a com. Everybody else on staff, you know, has almost encyclopedia. Steve Gerber and Buzz Dixon and all these guys, you know, have an encyclopedic knowledge of this stuff. And I, you know, I read comics like every other kid, but you know, it wasn't. You know, I stopped reading in eighth grade and didn't read again probably till college. Um, and uh, and so I'm thinking, well, it had to be the 40s or whatever. But I didn't give him an answer. I said, I don't know. When was it? I just and he said, 412. You know, <laughs> that's the you know the punchline of the joke is it's mm -hmm. it's whatever you were 12 is the golden age, and that is absolutely true. Yeah, I think you, you talked about um, childhood in childhood imprinting, mm -hmm. which I thought was a very interesting concept. You know, I deal a lot of the same stuff. I write books on computer role playing games. Right. The same question comes up all the time. Like, well, when was the era? You know, you can make a pretty good case for it was the 80s. It was the 90s. The two, I mean, there's stuff to be said for each time. But I really think this nails it. It's really, you know, what were you playing at age 12? You know, because that, yeah, exactly. that is, is going to be the golden age for you. What is funny, though, that I didn't see coming. I mean, is is there actually are kind of golden ages? I mean, you know, Transformers, we're now 40 years later, and the product has been continuously in production since then. And what we thought at the time was that we were like, a, it was like a sports team. And you could cycle in new players, you know, every year and out, but you still remain the team. You know, you're still the Oakland Raiders, you know, but, you know, John Madden's gone and Kenny Stabler's gone, but now we got, you know. Uh, and And what's interesting about it is that with this kind of stuff, it does settle at a point. And, you know, it, with the movie, it was a real shock to the system, which was a good thing. I think that's why we're still talking about it all these years later. And you got that poster in the background. But, yeah, um, yeah. you know, the you know, so, the, you know, that that's true. But um, you, people sort of settled on that lineup. You know what I mean? You know, the kind of, you know, the the you know, take the cast of the movie. And, and it's, you know, they brought out a lot of new characters since then and all that, but, you know, it's hard to have them have the impact and you almost have to give them a G1 expression to, to make them fly. You know, that's just my opinion, but there's not a lot refuting it. You know, there's not a lot of the Bay formers that's really stuck with the, you know, with the culture uh, and so on. It always defaults back to G1. Yeah, coming back to this 1985 quote, you know, you talked in here, about some of my all the Saturday morning cartoons, probably one of my favorite things. Right. Uh, you know, you, you jump up in the morning, you can't wait. Uh, but I never 
I knew nothing about like the back, like what was going on behind the scenes of these things. And I think it was uh, the puppy's further adventures, or maybe it was Mister. <laughs> yeah, it was the first script I ever wrote. Yeah, it was a puppy in the yeah. Badlands, which was uh, just a naked. I wrote it for Mark Jones, was a story editor, and it was just a naked snag off of of uh, North by Northwest. And it's like, mm-hmm. hey, I, you know, I, is that the way people do it? They just say I'm going to do North by Northwest with dogs. Okay, you know, because I'm like, you know, fresh out of film school and I had no practical experience, right? Well, I thought it was interesting when you, I, I think it must, I think it was Mr. T, the cartoon. You're saying that there was a, a couple of, sounded like panels of like yeah. advisors that would come in and say, okay, that's, you know, that's not a, I don't know if they talked about political correctness back then, but basically that's, that's not going to fly <laughs> or, or this is too violent. Can't have that in the cartoon. And it even got to the point. <laughs> You couldn't even have Mr. T say, I pity the fool. No, I mean, that, would, that would be insulting to people. Okay, I didn't know any of this was going on. The National Alliance of Fools would be upset. You know, yeah, no, I mean, you, you just, I mean, you know, no, it was a dress rehearsal. I mean, I, I mean, it's really funny. I, I mean, I, I think I put it in the book, but there was literally one day we went to a meeting. There's 65 people in the meeting. 65. Five of us were creatively I mean, involved in the show. I mean, okay. Yeah, okay. You're at a giant conference table. It's like, you know, only, you know, Ernst Stavro or Blofeld has that conference table, right? You know, it's this giant, you know, conference table. And, the, and you know, yeah, five, five of us were uh, writers and that. Joe Ruby was there. Uh, Cliff and Alana, me. I'm trying to think of who else. Um, I don't think Buzz was there because he, he he was known to misbehave in those meetings. But I, but maybe he was. I, I, could, I could be lying to you about that. But anyway, I mean, Buzz, Buzz like had, you know, the, the BOGA detector better than all the rest of us. But anyway, um, and what they had, and so there, and then there, are three, there were three network executives who were kind of like a uh, triumvirate that ran a NBC and figured they each had an assistant. So there, that counts for six more people. Everybody else was either about vi- violence or was part of a panel because Mr. T had an ethnic group you know, you know, it was, a, it was very diverse, you know, consciously, you know, pro-social was the term at the time, but that was kind of covered other things. They didn't have the modern terminology, but it was this era. And so if you have a Native American character, you had three Native American people that read the script, maybe from different tribes, like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I don't know what tribe this, this character's from. I'm not, and I'm not writing the tribe like they're a character, like they're a Native American character, they're just a character because... We have 22 minutes to tell a mystery story. Okay. So unless the, the story pivoted off one of the characters, you know, you, you didn't have a lot of time to do that. But anyway, so so pro- probably, you know, another 20 people were there, or, you know, well, 21, say three from every you know group for various different ethnic groups. And, uh, and then we had, uh, then there was the violence people and they came in two flavors. There was imitatable action with the legal half of it. Meaning you don't have, you know, Superman put his cape over his head and jump off the, you don't want a kid to jump off the, the you know, the roof of the garage, right? Kid might see it, try to imitate it. It's, yeah, it was called perfect. imitatable action. Right. And you didn't want imitatable action. So they, there were people who read that, that concern. And then there are people who are just, you know, morally opposed to violence. And I remember one of the, one of the guys, a German guy, you know, I mean, he looked like, you know, some of the bad Nazis in some war movie, but, you know, he actually did not talk like that. Um and they were just philosophically opposed to violence, right? And, and so every one of those people would read every script you wrote from their, their perspective, right? And then, you know, and give you notes. And, um, uh, you know, and, and so you knew you were getting 60 notes on your script because people have to put a note on the script, you know, to justify what, their patience. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, to justify their existence, you know, and... And, and some of them were helpful. I mean, it's, it's easy to mock this, you know, and, you know, because a lot of it was, you know, was mockable, but it was, you know, it's the world we find ourselves in now, you know, just in a larger scope, uh, you know, scope. And it was, you know, and, and like, you know, I mean, I was such a noob at that point. All I was trying to do was just write the mystery. And I wrote everybody pretty vanilla. 
you know, I, I mean, but even I knew, you know, I've been to Berkeley, right? You know, even I knew you don't write Mr. T in dialect. Like a lot of the real writers were like, you know, writing him the way he actually talked. I wrote him like he was William Buckley and I let, let him sort it out and the because they did a live wraparound <laughs> with him. You know what I mean? I, I don't think he played his voice in the show, but I think, you know, he did a live wraparound to give you a sort of a moral to the story, which is how I got into the Writers Guild. Mm -hmm. Why I'm carrying a picket sign around today, as a matter of fact. But, um, you know, yeah. That, so that that's what it was. They, we, they were they were really scrutinized and regulated, and it was that environment, you know, that that everybody was fleeing when we went to do Joe and Transformers. Steve Gerber literally sent me a, when he wanted me to come ghost story edit for him. Sent me a thing. He said, "Hey, we get to hit people with real fists. <laughs> Looks incredibly cool when you lift your mug, by the way, because the background comes through." Oh, I've seen the Transformer it's movie in the mug. You see that? Oh, it's not happening right now. There it is, right there. Magic. Yeah, like you say in the in the book that you know, come up, uh, I mean, at least with the Mister T stuff. I mean, the stuff you had to work around, like you can't hit anybody. You can like leave a no. chair for somebody might have to move no. it. You, all, the worst you could do would be kind of negligent, I, you know, negligence. I mean, I can see why. You, yeah, you don't want stuff in there, like you say. You don't want kids to get hurt watching this. You don't want you know to be offensive or something. But it seems like the there's more negative than there's positive for this because what ends up happening, you, you end up with a product that doesn't have any lasting cultural impact, right? Nobody's, I don't know if nobody talks about it anymore. You kind of say that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, that was the, the, that's the amazing thing is people, there are people oddly enough with the Mr. T show, yes. people kind of remember it fondly when somebody remembers it, but they never talk about it. You know, you wouldn't have, I mean, you know, Transformers people can go on for hours and hours and hours. And you have to remember, Mr. T was number one show on Saturday morning, which means wow. millions of people watched it. And it just vanishes. Now, nobody talks about the puppy. Okay. Once again, watched by millions of people. Like high, really puppies, highly rated show. What? Puppies for their adventures. You had to look that one up. I... Yo, okay. I but Mr. I mean, T. think about it. Millions of people watch that. Many more than watch Transformers mm -hmm. in the first run or G.I. Joe oh. or any of that stuff. Now, you know, the aggregate over the years, obviously, is much bigger for the others. But, I mean, on first run, you know, and, and they just vanished without a trace because, I mean, for probably a lot of reasons, you know, um, because, you know, there's no fan base. It wasn't merchandise. It wasn't, you know, I mean, there are a lot of reasons other than just the, the you know the things being pretty vapid but yes if you pound the crap out of any artistic impulse anybody has it is very hard to create something lasting because you what you end up doing is diffusing any vision somebody might have had that having been said mr t made my career so i mean i you know i can't you know i mean i when i wrote the third one it was uh the 100 year old mystery it was just, I just got this like idea and you sort of know, oh, this is really good. And I wrote it and I walked into the studio and everybody was looking at me funny. And it was like, what happened? You know, I thought, oh, I'm going to be fired. Because remember I was there, you know, I was on like a, you know, a two week contract and then it turned into a three month contract. And the network had said, he's the only one who can write this show. So all of a sudden you have the noob, okay, <laughs> who's the only person who can write the show and that, you know. That had a number of, of amusing, you know, comedy ensued, you know. Um, so, but but anyway, so yeah, I mean, I remember that very fondly. But you're right, culturally, people remember A Team, people sort of remember Mr. T. But you, you know, even though we you know, explicitly had morals and lessons for the kids and all that, you know, I, I mean, if they're not even remembered in the funny way that the PSAs and GI Joe and and, trans, and GI Joe are remembered, you know, where they, you know, they knowing is half the battle. Those things. Yeah. So you think that uh, you know, you think we're kind of returned to that mentality now, right? Well, I know. I think that mentality the took over the culture. I think that bunch, is, uh, at, at this very moment, it is changing back in a, an alarming velocity. But I mean, I think the, we, what we saw over COVID was the apex of of that culture. You know, I mean, because it ultimately leads to cancel culture. I mean, what do you do to people that don't conform? You know, and that it, it hit its logical you know, end state. And, and I think our culture realized that's not sustainable and nobody's winning from this. That's my political rant for the day. We'll stop now. Oh, I don't say that. I was going to get into something. I was going to get oh, into Okay, feel free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know quite how to make the transition, but I wanted to just to ping you to see what you thought. 
because you had uh you, you've had some experience working with unions and you talked about that and the you know, carrying a picket sign multiple times a week you know as mandated by the union yes i'd just like to know what you think about this the sort of stuff that's going on now with the over the ai well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, the union, the you know, the strikes complex. I mean, some of it is it's a complicated stuff. thing, but right. yeah, you're somebody oh, I mean, that would have a. <laughs> I would listen to about it. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I mean, here's here's my feeling about AI is there's an underlying issue. I mean, I don't, I don't feel like we have done. You know, there are two, there are two sets of opponents in the in the strike. One's the usual suspect, which are the studios. But they're all in serious trouble. And then standing in the backdrop are the tech companies. Okay. And I consider Amazon, Netflix, Apple, uh, you know, to some extent, even Disney, a tech company. Okay. I mean, if you run a streaming platform, you, you have more in common with tech than you do with, you know, old time cable, in my opinion. I, yeah, I worked at Google for five years when we, I was at Niantic, right? Mm -hmm. in, at, like starting in 2011. Um, and, uh, yeah, Google. I worked at Google. I was a contractor with a WGA contract. Okay, at Google. Okay, you know, and you have the business affairs guys. Do they still have unions like in on the waterfront and stuff like that? That's what they're saying. Okay, you know, and this they you know this is a, diff, a different era. That was this was a decade ago. But anyway, and then California law made me become an employee, so I became a point eight employee, which means you get the stock and the health insurance and you know all that stuff. Um, and I wasn't, I, it wasn't covered by the union anymore, which was great with Niantic because then I got stock, right? Uh, and uh, so it, it was kind of good. Um, but, I, you know, I liked maintaining my sort of freelance status because, you know, if you're going to run a career, you have to do multiple things at the same time because any project can die at any moment. Um, anyway, so... Um, the AI, AI itself, the, the concern people express is that somehow chat GPT is going to take our jobs away from us. And maybe 15 iterations from now, that's possible. Like right now, you, you know, you say, tell chat, Buzz Dixon, put in, write a GI Joe script in the Buzz Dixon style. And for the first seven seconds of looking at it, it's like, wow, this is great. And then you realize, well, this is not really a script and it's not really a story and the characters aren't talking like the characters and, you know, it's and and I mean, because, you know, first off, you can sort of imitate Buzz Dixon, but can't do it like it's really Buzz writing. Right. You know, because it can only look at the past. And that's a problem with anything data based. And it's a problem with AI is AI. All it can do is go scrape the Internet. OK, and so let's hold on that thought for a second. Right. For Because this gets the guild strike. What it can't do, it, it can combine things in interesting ways. But it, it, it can't really do anything that hasn't been done before, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. I mean, it can't it can't, re, you know, react to what it thinks the future is or, uh, you know, you know, that the, you mean the way we do, because data only looks one way. It looks back. Right. And time goes the other way. OK, so, yeah, I mean, it will evolve the way we write and what we write about the same way, you know, you know, the camera, you know, was really rough on a lot of portrait artists but it was really great for creating impressionists and expressionists and surrealists and all that. Cause it's all of a sudden let's go do stuff. The camera doesn't do. And then finally, you know, Brown time Photoshop came out. It's like, oh, the camera's not enough. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and then you don't even believe the camera because, you know, deep fakes and all that. I mean, we're in a very interesting place culturally right now, but you know, that's the way that, you know, they're the, and, and I see the AI issue slightly differently. And that is if it's scraping the internet, what it's really doing is internet intellectual property theft or, you know, using intellectual property. It may be owned by other people. It's sitting on the internet. Now, if the guild was saying, we want a percentage of that, you know, your algorithm knows what it's scraping. So we have to do a micro payment every time, you know, we scrape this, this resource and paid some kind of royalties, probably everybody would win. Okay, I mean, yes, the you know the tech companies would win less, but I mean, you know, all of a sudden you'd be getting royalty checks for stuff you did years ago. Seems, you know, seems reasonable. This is not, yeah, this is not going to happen in the real world. But that would be the argument I would make. For that's a stronger anti AI argument. Is just, hey, you're using copyrighted owned material, pay for it. You know, in some kind of micropayment. Um, and and the second thing is, 
that with all the layoffs and all the chaos that's happened at the tech companies, I don't know why the guilds are not trying to organize them. That they would truly fear. Okay, you know, uh, you know, because they don't want uh, Amazon doesn't want unions. You know, no, none of them want unions. But the, the conditions where unions happen are are just beginning now. You know, for the tech companies because it blooms off it. You know, the Whopper stock options and the ridiculous. You know, uh, you know, you know, catered gourmet lunches and all. I think that's that's heading into the rearview mirror. You know, so so yeah, I think they're. They're fighting, and and also, I'm so they're carrying a you know a picket sign around. Okay, you know, you're not going to beat a 21st century tech company with a 19th century you know you know tactics. So you have to go figure out how to win it. And I think the guild, and you know, the, that's true of SAG and of the WGA, is we're not being treated well in the media. Well, partly because the media outlets are precisely the people that we're picketing against. I mean, you know, who owns? Fox television, you know, who owns CBS, who owns Disney, who owns any of these places, right? And and so that's you know kind of a loser. And um and so and and you know the public is viewing as a bunch of you know spoiled pampered people because that's the face of it that they see. They don't know that 90% of the people in the union are people that really do need their you know pension and health and really do need um you know that stuff. And so you kind of don't have your usual allies. Is this? Tell me if this gets boring because this is. I'm probably it's more of an well, answer. Than well, I really like this. You're giving them the inside perspective. I haven't gotten so. <laughs> well, this is just my opinion. I remember this is sanctioned by nobody, but you know, um, you know. So I, I feel like we have to do a little bit of outreach to to people. I mean, in the old days, you know, actors, you know. Now they only sort of pop up on Twitter saying something political. And that's just not, no matter what you say, you're alienating half the country. And you're not going to win if you're alienating half the country, you know? And so I'm looking at, a, you know, you know, a, a, you know, the, when the WG, I mean, sorry, when the, when the uh, SAG went out and I'm seeing Adam Schiff there, you know what I mean? You know, he, yes. And he is the representative for Burbank. If you want to lose half the country fast, just have Adam Schiff be the face of your movement. And you're losing the half of the country that isn't already against you because they're not represented by the people that own the, the networks that are broadcasting you. You know what I mean? So, and, and I just get the feeling people don't really like Hollywood right now. We don't really have superstars like we did. We do Tom Cruise. Okay. That's our superstar. You know, some have aged out Harrison Ford and Clint Eastwood, and there just aren't new ones being made. There are a lot of actors with successful careers, but it's not like it was because it just doesn't seem like they're going out trying to make friends. You know what I mean? Or, or giving giving anything and just, you know, being present at some charity things, not cutting it anymore. You know, they used to, actors used to be these mysterious people who, when they appeared, it was a big deal. And they always appeared kind of in their, their persona. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, they're just another slob. You talked a lot in here about John Wayne and how much you liked his movies. And he, he comes up a lot in this book. I think he's even the inspiration for Optimus Prime. Yes, he was. The like, it's hard to imagine Prime. somebody like that today, right? A, a new John Wayne. Like, what would that even look like? Well, you want to know the brutal irony of the strike is you realize the last time that SAG and the Writers Guild went out together was 1960. Okay, I'm reading this in places you would not expect to read this. Who was the president of SAG in 1960? It was, don't tell me it was John Wayne. <laughs> no? Close. Um, Guy who had an infinitely bigger political career than John Wayne. Oh, it uh, must have been Reagan. Yep. And, and now they're saying if we need Ronald Reagan again, because the result of the 1960 strike was the pension and, uh, and, and health plans we have now. Yeah, the, the strike was very much very analogous to now because media was transitioning from, you know, two movies were being run on the networks and people weren't getting anything for the, you know, their movies showing on the networks. Hmm. And so the deal Reagan made was, OK, anything, you know, earlier than 1948 or some date, I can't remember the date, you know, is not covered by this. Um, but that was just the deal he had to make. And and it worked. And, you know, that created, you know, with the modern, you know, you know, Hollywood unions, it, you could argue. I think with the I was thinking a lot about the some of the concerns I've heard about the AI and even like a they could replace an actor. 
you know, like that, a that I don't, I just don't know about. I mean, I, I understand the fear, yes. But it kind of reminds me of uh, like but they should be paid so much time working in the animation industry. Mm -hmm. So you know, you could have a new movie come out with Optimus Prime. All the gang could be back. You know, what's that? Well, line that is why. What's that line yeah. about the, the mouse never? Had, the mouse has no agent or something like that yeah right well yeah that's the whole thing i mean the, you know, the the great thing about animated characters even back in the 80s is they don't develop substance abuse problems they don't go on strike they don't go on vacation they don't you know you know have divorces they don't demand more money mickey just shows up mm -hmm. you know bugs daffy they're right there you know and and that that in you know i, I was being a little sarcastic about it in the book but you know that's kind of why what take a look at the last generation of movies of major movies from studios what do they all have in common with uh, one notable except with sequels, one uh, but what but their costume characters I mean. you know in other words robert downey jr did one of the most brilliant jobs anybody's ever done anywhere for any reason when he did iron man i think that launched the whole marvel thing Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is you can put anybody in an Iron Man. Iron Man's basically an oh. animated movie, you know, once you look at the CG, right? You know, you have live action shooting the actors, but mm -hmm. what it was, it was, you know, Hollywood and Disney saying, okay, we can kill two birds with one stone. It is, we don't have to pay ridiculous actor money because we're using costume characters. And, and, you know, and we, they're it, fungible and replaceable. I mean, how many people played Batman? Now they've spent a lot of money on those actors on different occasions, but point is you know you know you, you there, people go to see batman they don't necessarily go to see the actor mm. okay and and you know that's why you want a lot of costumes star wars is sort of the same thing and then you can sell toys of it because you, you tend to sell toys of things that aren't you know real gi joe is an exception to that but you know by and large you know the you know they, they you sell sell toys from that so that was the strategy and the problem now is they've almost hit design exhaustion and the problem that I think is hitting the, you know, the, this is a, everything I'm saying is a gross overgeneralization, but I think it's, you know, it's, you know, it, there's validity inside of it, um, you know, is, is when it's about costume characters that doesn't create a lot of actors that, you know, that people have, have huge fan bases. And the world, the internet did something we didn't see coming, and that is made the world smaller. You know, I mean, you know, I, I would argue Tom Cruise is the last standing superstar and and music is dominated by one person. And we all know who it is right now. My daughter went to see her two nights ago. <laughs> you know, I mean, Taylor Swift basically dominates it. And then after Taylor Swift, you have bands that were playing 50 years ago. You know, Rolling Stones still still pack a stadium. Who can still pack a stadium? You know. The remnants of all the other bands still can and and it, there's aren't a lot of new people coming up that are grabbing that because it's like instead of the world just be you know yes there are endless new kinds of music and all that but i don't even see it yeah, you know just, what i mean it, you know it's it, it tends to coalesce around one person i think of that sometimes in the context of uh, weird al mm -hmm. who he makes an appearance in transformers or his song yeah he does i love it but but anyway yeah, I was just thinking when he was kind of in his heyday, one of the things was everybody had heard the songs a million times that he was parodying. Yep. Everybody had, you know, everybody heard Michael Jackson. You know, everybody had heard Madonna. You know, it's, it's it's kind of hard to think. Like, who would he pick nowadays that, like, you could... Uh, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, because because I have a daughter. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's true. There Because that was, that was the death of AM radio. You know, and, I mean, because AM radio, which, you know, I grew up on, you know, it tells you how old I am, but, that, you know, and then FM. I mean, everything, when I was a kid, everything was a fight. You know, there was AM versus FM. There was Marvel versus DC. There was, you know, everything was like sports, you know, and, uh, you know, and there'd always be the third, you know, kind of dark horse in the mix. Um, and, um, you know, and so... Well, the thing about AM radio is for all the people would whine about, you know, having to look because you, know, you could be in a half an hour, you could hear Barbara Streisand, Jimi Hendrix, the Monkees, the Doors, uh, you know, uh, Tony Bennett. I mean, you know, Frank Sinatra, you know, uh, you know, and Jimi Hendrix all inside the same hour. Right. And the Beatles, of course, and, and yeah, and the Rolling Stones and, and then a bunch of one hit wonders. 
and, and, and it constantly changed. But what it was, it played everywhere. There's also public music then. You know, I mean, we walk into a store, they're playing. I mean, literally, it's true. Johnny, uh, uh, Johnny Rivers did a song about uh, summer 67, I think it was. But it was talking about, you know, how everywhere you went, you heard Sgt. Peppers. You could not not hear. It. I remember playing miniature golf. I'm hearing it. I'm at the ice cream place. I'm hearing it. I'm, you know, riding my bike into the school. I'm hearing it. I go to my friend's house. And, and so there was, a, there was a cultural, you know, lingua franca of the music. But as I said, I also knew Frank Sinatra and Nancy Sinatra. And you know, I remember the first time I heard My Way and I said, boy, that sounds a lot like the end. You know, and I was you know, the guy, Jimi Hendrix and Frank Sinatra. I mean, sorry, Jim Morrison and Frank Sinatra kind of blurred my head. Um, and I was not entirely wrong about that. But, uh, the, you know, yeah, uh, it, you know, and now... There's no, you, there's no public music. Everybody's wearing earbuds. There's a, there's a, a sense of, of mass isolation right now. I think that, I mean, it was, I think a Christmas music is really the only music that everybody yep. hears, and that's of course yep. a seasonal. That's for one week a year. Yeah, one, one week. And, and part of it is, that, you know, I, a lot, a lot of people are, you know, there, there is a movement to change our, our culture, which means all of a sudden you have nothing that is bonding you together. Mm -hmm. You know that, and that's considered religious music, and even Christmas music divides into which it didn't used to. The secular stuff like Santa Claus is coming to town, and and religious stuff like you know, yeah, uh, you know, what child is this, or you know, or you know, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, or something. You know, even that has its division, and you know, you don't patriotic stuff. People are always fighting against that, and that was the other thing we once had. I mean, everybody knew the Nar national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, and you know, and so on. GI Joe theme yeah. song. Yeah, God for it. What <laughs> the GI Joe theme song? Yeah, yeah, GI Joe. Yeah, well, that real American shows. hero. I, I, yeah, you don't have shows with theme songs anymore. You know, I'm sitting there watching Lincoln Lawyer. I don't hear he's Lincoln Lawyer. You know, I mean, I don't hear that. I'd be happy to, you know, Yellowstone theme. So, I mean, though I will say that, you know, Shazamming stuff off of TV shows has probably been my biggest musical influence because, uh, you know, people don't voluntarily, you know, we have, we, we love new stuff and we hate it. If you're Derek Thompson's book, uh, Hitmakers, um, and a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people are saying things like this, but he just says we have neophilia and neophobia at the same time. And that is, we like new stuff, but we don't like new stuff. I mean, it's really painful to be forced to listen to something new. With AM radio, you heard it whether you wanted to or not. You could always flip it, you know, like I grew up in Chicago, so you hit WLS, and then they put on something really obnoxious, you know, like Bobby Sherman or something, boom, you're over at, uh, you know, WCFL. You know, whereas now you don't have it. But the point is that it was all the same, you know, you know, genetic pool of music. Neo, neophilia and neophobia. Yeah, well, neo is new. There's philia, mm -hmm. love of new mm -hmm. and, and, and fear of new or dislike of new. What, how are you translate phobia? Yeah, I was, you know, that, that, you know, thinking about the music, I would talk, 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 same thing with games. You know, a lot of times being a kid in the 80s, you might get this one game for your birthday or for Christmas because you couldn't afford, you know, to have hundreds of thousands of games. And you might not like it at first or the album, you know, you might really hate it, but you keep playing it enough and eventually it starts to grow on you. And then the next thing you know, that's your favorite game or that's your favorite album. Yep. Like I, my worry is that the kids will never have that experience now because there's nothing there to like. There's no reason to listen to that song twice if you didn't like it, if it didn't oh, catch you the first time. Okay, when I went to college, right? Okay, I moved from Chicago to Berkeley. Okay, you, you come out of Chicago, you've never heard of the Grateful Dead. Okay, I mean, you've heard of them, but I mean, I'd never, maybe I'd heard trucking or, you know, something like that. But you show up in Berkeley and like, you know, every roommate I have is a deadhead and I'm, I'm sitting there, I got the Who and the Stones and like, you know, all that stuff. You know, a very, uh, you know, you know, prosaic stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, very, you know, like average stuff, but there's like a whole different music up in the Bay Area. Some of it was stuff I knew. I mean, I knew of Jefferson Airplane slash Starship. I knew uh, Santana. I knew, you know, but, but, you know, you'd actually see these guys playing in the student union. They'd set up their stuff. And, and, but anyway, it was like, and you were constantly exposed to it. Now, when I hear dead stuff, I didn't really ever, I went to, probably three or four dead concerts, you know, but in and, and wake of the flood was an album I always liked, but like now I hear it and it's a nostalgia stuff. I've hated at the time. 
really brings it back. And, and so that's this weird gift that pays off decades later. And it's just all this enforced dead listening that, you know, to, uh, that I would do. And, and people had their like regional things and their personal things. The guy next door that was just into, you know, Joe Walsh and Barnstorm, right? You know, I mean, I, you know, we played the James Gang song in my high school band, but I, I mean, you know, Joe Walsh didn't like pop up big on my radar. However, the Sky Console played and I realized this stuff is actually quite brilliant. And then, of course, he shows up in the Eagles and, and probably makes a difference. But point being that, yes, there's no public music now. You would be introduced to stuff in some dorm room or you go to a friend's house because the, the album was rare. OK, and, it, it, you know, like, you know, 369 or whatever I paid was not crippling, but I mean, it was a financial decision in a trade-off. So I bought it and I want to get my money's worth. So I'd play it a bunch of times and it imprinted. Now I'm sitting on Spotify. I'm not, I'm not an enemy of Spotify. It's like, we're in this era where we've gotten so much, yeah. but we've lost stuff too. Now we want to get back some of the, what we've lost and keep what we have. You know, it's, it's reconciling all of it. You know, now I go on Spotify. I don't listen to anything, you know, twice. And, you know, I, I mean, I create playlists, but, um, but I don't have this growing sense of music that was just part of life before. And you used like, to have to watch TV shows you didn't particularly like, but then they grow on you. The, uh, the gatekeepers is, is less of a factor, I feel like. Because yeah, anybody, no, could, anybody could put an album, stick it on Spotify. Right. Good luck trying to get more than a handful of people. There are no gatekeepers. I mean, the, the brutally honest thing is, A, to make money, and B, to get exposure, you have to pay live, meaning you have to go back, play live, you have to go back to the 50s. I mean, people are live streaming Taylor Swift, and I mean, what's it tell you about the, the power of, of that particular entity that she can live stream her concerts and still fill, you know, uh, uh, LA, so, you know, low, low-fi stadium, so, not so-fi stadium, uh, low-fi stadium um, for uh, seven days. I mean, she may well have more people show up for a concert than the Rams are going to have show up all season, or maybe in the Rams and the Chargers, who both play there. I have to admit, I've never watched Taylor Swift. <laughs> oh, I mean, look, I, you know, if I didn't have a daughter who just like hit that train about perfectly demographically, yeah. I wouldn't have known, I, you know, I wouldn't have noticed her. But what I will tell you, I mean, so I knew all the like the obvious hits, you know, the, you know, like you and you've heard a hundred of them. You just didn't know it. You know, we will never, ever, ever get back together and shake it up and all that. And I thought, yeah, it's kind of I mean, it was evident she had talent. One day I'm sitting there minding my own business. And the way our house is structured, the, my daughter's room is right above where where I will sit and write sometimes in the living room. And and there's no acoustical, anything blocking it. So she's playing an album. I'm listening to it. It's really good. It's a female singer. I'm mm -hmm. thinking, it's not Joni Mitchell. It's not Joni, you know. You know and I said, Gwena, who is this? Taylor Swift. And I'll say, whoa. Okay, that's not what I thought it was. Because the feeling I had listening to it was like when you listen to a Dylan album for the first time, you know, in the 70s. Wow. It, it was that feeling. And I realized, oh, she's not what I thought she was. And then, you know, and my daughter will explain to me, you know, uh, my daughter just graduated from art college, you know, but she was explaining to me. Um, and also, you know, I'd done these uh, alternate reality games and she did uh, as an art project in one of our games where she was putting all these different assets we had on the, uh, you know, on a thing like it looked like a murder board, but I told her I wanted it to look like a murder board, but you know, an investigator board you see on every police show like yeah. that. But like if somebody did that at the Met, I wanted to look like that. And so she did that. And so she began to see how all the story tied together with all these different elements, you know, that, you know, and you, you had to, you had to sort of figure it out. You know, it's like a puzzle, like the story itself is a game. And, and she was explaining to me that the eras tour the Taylor Swift's on now is all over different eras. She has 110 uh, wardrobe changes right? 110. And, uh, you know, it, it goes back all the way through her career with all these like sly references in colors and because every album has a different color. So now you've got the kids, you know, wearing bracelets with the, all the successive colors. In other words, she turned her career into an alternate reality game in a, in a shocking way. And I got into alternate reality games when, you know, you're way too young for this, but you know, Google it sometime. There, there was a rumor that Paul McCartney was dead, right? You ever heard about that? Oh, yeah. Paul's yeah. dead thing? Okay, it hits some, me. Some it something in a song or something that 
Well, a lot more than that. It, it hits me at that moment, you know, at, at the golden age. Okay. I'm sitting there, you know, Abbey Road had just come out. I'm sitting there with a guy named, uh, named Marty Silver sitting in, is this getting really boring, by the way? The, oh. I mean, okay. All right. Uh, I got named Marty Silver. Who I, I wouldn't remember, but he had a Paul McCartney haircut. He's sitting in front of me. He said, you realize Paul McCartney's dead? And I said, what? He you know, wasn't in the Chicago Tribune and I heard it on the radio. I'm quite sure I would have heard if Paul McCartney had died. He said, oh no, he died two years ago. And the clues are all over the albums and the songs. Mm -hmm. And just, just Google Paul, Paul is dead and just see what comes back to you because their whole website's dedicated to this. But over the next three days was this experience. You know, I just started in my band. I was like the most incompetent bass player that ever got paid to play music. But, uh, you know, um, the, uh, we had this experience where we're literally, you know, a friend of ours had a real, real tape recorder. So we're playing the songs backwards or spinning the records backwards, which would become uh, DJing, right? And, and with all that analog equipment, you could actually do it. And we're sitting there with our speakers halfway in there. Does he say, I buried Paul? Or does he say, I'm very tall? Because there'd be little snippets of dialogue sitting in the middle of that. I think that's at the end of Strawberry Fields, right? And, and you know, little snippets of dialogue, you know, and if you play... You know, Revolution Number Nine. Is it really saying "Turn Me On, Dead Man"? And then you listen to a "Day in the Life," and there's a guy who blew his mind out in a car. Well, that was McCartney as an Aston Martin. And then on the Beatles White Album poster, there's a picture of a guy. Like God knows who he is. I to this day I don't know. But the point is, they're saying that's the actor they got to play him after Paul died, and wow. they just you know okay. And what was so wonderful about it is an alternate reality game experience. I didn't really believe it. Okay. But but at the same time, I was intrigued by how all these pieces over the last four albums come together. You know, the walrus was Paul. Well, the walrus in Viking mythology is a symbol of death. OK, you know, like all these clues were there to the point where I have the Happy Life magazine. I was just talking about this in a, you know, in an ARG discussion. Um, the Life magazine thing where they see proof positive Paul's alive. Look, he's right here. Yeah. You know, uh, he tells this story, you know, I mean, it's, you know, um, and, and then, uh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, also too, just, just, I don't think I didn't collect ever. Oh, I'm sorry. Here is, here is Paul is still with us. Okay. <laughs> and this is, this was the, the, you know, I mean, when life magazine said it was true. Remember that was the world we lived in too. You know, yeah. you had life and you had luck. You had time and you had Newsweek. And then there was always the C one, you know, like U.S. News and World Reports. But but you live, we lived in a monoverse. And, and, you know, Paul McCartney could be sitting on the front of Life magazine that, you know, may have been, you know, I mean, now, like, you, you go to the tabloids, I don't even know half the people, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just as sleazy as the next guy, I'll, you know, stand around the, in the uh, you know, grocery store line and be reading about, you know, you know, sloppy celebrity lives. I don't even know who any of them are, you know, you know, somebody from real housewives about whatever. Okay. Yeah. I had asked a friend of mine who Ryan Seacrest was <laughs> because I heard of him a million times. It was Ryan Seacrest anyway. And I, and he said, you know, he told me, and I said, how is it that? I don't know that. And he said, well, he's just never done anything that would even capture your attention. The point is all of this stuff in those days, you know, would, would, you know, you know, you couldn't avoid it. So you knew about it. So the entire everybody had a shared vision of what the world was. Now you get curated news. You know, you want something with the right word spin, you're going to Fox. You want, you know, some left word spin, you're on MSNBC or, you know, pretty much any other outlet. But there was an agreed upon picture of what the world was. Thought bubbles or uh, some. Yeah. Like but anyway, yeah. So that's how I got. And I realized that's what Taylor Swift was doing. And she became kind of fascinating when I realized that. And then they, they, she and Paul McCartney, oddly enough, interviewed each other over COVID, you know, in Rolling Stone. You realize they're the same person. And they're, you know, I mean, just this, you know, she was just saying, you know, I was watching Get Back, you know, the thing George Martin, I mean, uh, uh, what's the name? You know, the guy who did Lord of the Rings put together. She said, I was watching that. When you stood up from that piano, you were 27 years old, meaning, you're, you're 80 and you're still filling stadiums. I mean, how, how, what keeps you going? And you wonder why she was asking it. And she was talking about, you know, you did an album right after that where you played every instrument on it. And, you know, and, and you know, he always acts like, 
Oh yeah, you know, I had this tape recorder. Like anybody in the world can just suddenly decide that <laughs> they're a drummer and a keyboard player and a guitarist and all. You know, I mean, kind of either unaware or being modest about the fact that he's a freak outlier, one in a million mutant. You know, but anyway, I don't. I have no idea how I got off on that thing. I'm not real linear. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of the, the, I guess, idea of the life is kind of a game, and it's got these moving parts and. It's recreational, I guess. I've heard people talk about uh, theories, kind of, a, it's like a recreational belief, even if you don't seriously believe it, it's just fun to fun to look into it and research it. Uh, no, uh, well, that, well, that was the thing was, it hit that perfect edge of, I didn't believe it. It was, you know, it's like, you know, all the Kennedy assassination, you know, conspiracy yeah. theories. And that stuff's just was, and I remember sitting in college and, you know, and you're sitting in your dorm room and some guy will show up who you don't know, and spend 10 hours, you know, you know, not 10 hours, but like, you know, two hours talking about, uh, you know, grassy knolls and, and you know, book depositories and, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the guy raising the umbrella. And it's like, oh, wow, that's really, you know, and did I believe it? No, not for a minute. I mean, what's funny is, you know, my whole career I've written about, it's even shows up in Joe and then to a far lesser extent in Transformers about conspiracy theories. I just find them hilarious. I mean, I just love them but I never once had one I believed. Okay. I mean, I believe it was probably Lee Harvey Oswald all alone in a book depository. If you really polygraph me, that's probably what I thought. Now there's no such thing as conspiracy theory. I don't believe, but that's because the times we're living in. Yeah. I was, uh, I didn't realize that the transformers, you, know, you talked in here a little bit about how that was kind of inspired to some extent by some real life global politics and uh, concern about running out of oil, I think was the, Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, there was like these was. like political issues of the day that made it their way transformed, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and and you put you put politics, you kind of have to put quotes around it in that the environment was so different than now that like you could be, you know, you could like Ronald Reagan, or not like Ronald Reagan or whatever. But it wasn't like now where it's just blood sport. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, and and, you know, most people agreed. Yeah, just pretty modern. You know, the Russians are the bad guys and we had to win the Cold War and inflation was bad. And, you know, and that's, you know, he he took office, you know, right after the uh, Iran hostage, hostage crisis. And, uh, you know, it, it so it's like you can have healthy disagreements, but it wasn't like you were trying to destroy the person that disagreed with you. You were just arguing with them. And it was actually kind of fun and it was sport. You know, I mean, I was a rhetoric major, right? You know, so I thought it was just great to like do this. And it was very recently that I realized you can't do this anymore. I mean, you know, I am on Facebook. I just argue whatever side I thought was losing, you know, just because that it was fun. Um, and and I and and you there, you know, there are very real ramifications for that kind of stuff. And and it's not to me. It's it. It's like it's not like people technically know more but they understand less than they used to that's um, uh what's say mario cuomo said that and I, I realized you know he's exactly right he was talking about my generation when he said that but he was exactly right we 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 have access to all sorts of information but there's very little time spent processing it and and honestly debating it you know anyway that, that rants mm -hmm. over but um oh yeah what else are we talking about here yeah, the, we both have that rhetoric connection in, in common, you know, but I, you know, I just think about the the school I went, or school, college when I was in college, you know, learning from these professors and they'd talk about critical thinking, you know, right. rhetoric, rhetoric and logical thing. And it's like, that's all out the window now. Yep. You can't do that now. No, no. I mean, it, it's not only that we've just gotten less rigorous, but it's downright vilified. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, this is like, you know, hegemonic, you know, you know, white man thinking or something, you know, and we're not doing a service to the world, spreading that kind of stuff around, you know, because I mean, you really do have to, you know, look at things and analyze them and be able, I mean, you don't understand an issue unless you can argue the other side of it as well as you can argue your own. Like the oldest rhetorical training, right? You yeah, well, that's what it was. I mean, all these sophists. Yeah, I mean, I wrote my thesis about this sophist who, you know, uh, you know, a, you know, I mean, which was basically sort of their way of saying shyster at that point, because the sophists tended to be lawyers. But, um, you know, all these sophists who, uh, uh, you know, would, would, you know, 
you know, get up and argue one side of an issue one day and turn around and argue the other side the other day, which I think, and we used to have to do that in rhetoric class, you know, because you, you realized the minute you had to go argue the other side of it, you realized that somewhere in there, whatever you believed, there's a valid case. I mean, anything that's both argumentative and arguable, you know, they're, they're, the other side has just as good a case as you do. In theory, you have to figure out why yours, why yours is better. I mean, that literally is because critical thinking is turned into criticize everything. It uses the other, it, you know, it's a distortion of the term critical, right? And, and, and you know, and say we just got a time where, you know, it, it's all about, you know, the other guy's, you know, totally wrong and I'm 100% right and he's stupid or evil if he believes that he, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, that is not the way to advance a civilization. All right, so as I said, ran over. All right, so... <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, and I want the, you know, well, getting back to the, the original thing you were saying about the 80s, we want it back partly because it was our childhood and partly because, you know, it's the golden age because we were 12. But you want it back partly because it was the last pre-digital decade. And, and, and even, you know, I talk about it in the book that when Steve Gerber set up his bulletin board, okay, and all the bulletin board was originally for was for us to be able to send scripts in our impossibly fast, you know, 312 modems or whatever, you know, whatever the, you know, I mean, like laughably slow by today's standard. Oh yeah, you, you know, they, these, you know, they, they were, it was ridiculously, you know, you know, primitive stuff by modern standards, but then it was like just pure magic. And, uh, and you know, and so, you know, we that was how we downloaded our scripts. And what happened was, it ended up being an almost perfect dress rehearsal for what would become, you know, the internet in that, you know, people got in these horrible, you know, you know, fights and they're threatening each other. And, and I remember the, the agent, a woman in Candy Montero who represented pretty much every animation writer, um, you know, was one time saying that stuff's just poison. You guys got to stop doing it. And it was like, that was the, the perfect warning for, for what was, you know, what was coming and she saw it because she'd see, you know, she saw, you know, the world she knew blowing up, you know, people who should be working together, you know, busy, you know, brown mouthing each other. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, and she was not some, you know, techno progressive on the edge person. And the guy who built it was the least likely of Steve Gerber, who you would never, you would never have thought was any kind of technical guy, but he, he was so fascinated by it. He just figured it out. And yeah, we'd be leaving messages to each other. Oh man. And it was a perfect dress rehearsal for what we're living in now. And I should have known. I should have simultaneously bought stock and then tried to figure out how to make this not happen. But because it, you know, that's where we are. And I think it's not adding up to a lot of good. I also think that social media is, is has, it's not going anywhere anytime in our lifetimes. But I think it's kind of hit the high water mark. I think a lot of people are pretty sick of it. But that's just my theory. Well, I think a lot of people will agree with that. Uh, let's go okay. back. There's a part yeah. in here I really wanted to, to get back on uh, or to talk about. I was kind of curious. Uh, talking about this this era, we want to call it a golden era, I guess, but it was a... You talk a lot about George Lucas and some of your... Uh, my moments. adventures. At Lucas your adventures, stuff. there we go. Uh, but you had... I, I, I'll say, I'll, I mean, oddly enough, the payoff on it was good. They so had yeah. the Star Wars movies come out. Changed yep. everything. Huge, phenomenal. You know, we don't, you can't exaggerate the impact, right? And then yep. the first Indiana Jones movie. Yep. Incredible. You know, everybody would agree with that. But then you were watching somewhere in between there, the, the Temple of Elemental or no, Temple of Elemental. Temple of Doom. Yeah. Temple of Doom. I'm getting a game. Confused. Yeah. You're back in uh, DD. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm, I'm bilingual on that stuff. Uh, but you're like, this could never, this is like, you kind of realize this is the peak, you know, this will never be this easy again. Yeah. I remember, I remember consciously and knowingly having that feeling, you know, and it was July 4th weekend of, uh, of, uh, 84. And mm -hmm. that's when Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom came out and they were having a bet, which, which just struck me as like bad luck to do, do this, but there was an office pool on by how much would it beat the record for that weekend? You know, the all-time box office record for that weekend. And and I remember thinking, it's just never going to be this easy again, you know, for, for Lucasfilm or maybe for anybody. 
And, uh, and that, that was probably ended up being true. And I remember I said it to Paul Dini, who oddly enough to this day, I'm doing a project with Paul, um, uh, you know, is, you know, is, you know, yeah, this, this, you know, you know, we're at the apex of something and, and, you know, it just, it, you know, it's going to be a fight from here on out. And I think the next movie was, uh, I think that summer it's oddly enough, Steve Gerber, who is my, my story editor on uh, GI Joe got brought me in, uh, created Howard the duck. And that was uh, not the the best moment the theatricals ever had. I wonder how many people out there will remember that Howard the Duck movie. I, I've ne- you know, I've never seen it because that's when, you know, it was Gerber's movie. I like, I, you know, accidentally or, you know, I was doing something else and I didn't go see it the first weekend. Right. And then all the talk comes out. And because I hadn't seen it, I was just immune to uh, to i mean because you know obviously it was a very controversial thing and especially in the circles i was traveling in and i realized wow by simply not being there i just dodged all these you know fights and bad feeling and all that stuff and that became my tradition i just like you know would mysteriously not be around oh yeah i was on film you know uh, and this went through the batman movies because you know you're hanging around with you know frank and paul and guys like that you know you don't want to have an opinion about the Batman movie. Yeah, I gotta you know. ask you because you say nobody's ever asked you about your opinion of the Batman. I'm talking about the Keaton movie, right? So yeah, I, right. I, what is your opinion of it? I, you know, I need to I say I, that I, anymore because I'm asking you your opinion. Yeah, I'll give you the Weasley <laughs> answer to that, and that is that that you know I um you know I need to re-see them. I mean, the truth is, I thought they were just fine, and once sort of everybody's shock wore off and everybody had to have an opinion and all that. It seems like everybody decided the same thing and they're remembered very fondly. There's a lot of, that was one of the interesting things about that period is there were a lot of things, and maybe it's true of all periods. I just haven't lived in a different period, but you know, uh, you know, that, that, you know, at, at the time, you know, they were, you know, you know, very controversial and kind of reviled and, and, you know, in some circles and, and other people thought they were just great. And, you know, and, and, you know, it was, you know, the people had big opinions and then over time, you know, I think everybody's pretty much agreed, you know, those, they were actually pretty good. And that was a totally valid way to do the character. It was just so shocking, you know, because, you know, in those days you didn't have, I mean, you had Schwarzenegger and stuff like that, but you did not have the kind of actor that could put on that suit, you know, it wasn't until they figured out, you know, the padded suits and all. And I think even Michael Keaton had one of those, but you know, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, a very specific, you know, body type, like about three people in the world who could play that character at the time. And, and, you know, and, you know, now, of course, you know, I mean, steroids were coming in and, you know, and so you could sort of do that in the 80s, but not like you can now. And you, you certainly didn't have the special effects and, and all that. And so given the sandbox that Tim Burton was playing in, I think he did an amazing job. It wasn't like the... Adam West days. No, and, and you know, but Adam I would Adam argue. Is, I love the guy. I love the Batman show. Oh, I, that's what I'm saying. Okay. But he's but, not like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He doesn't look like the comic book. Oh, no, that was my golden age. I was 12. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, you know, because Frank Gorshin was the first villain and he, the Riddler was there. Riddler's probably, if I were totally honest, my favorite Batman villain. You know, and Batman's got the best rogues gallery, which is a real point of, you know, of, of, of you know that franchise worth discussing for the purposes of this conversation mm-hmm. is or any franchise is you know hero's only as good as his rogues gallery and and batman has by far the best i mean nobody's is even close yeah can, the gary gygax you know he talked he talked a lot about him obviously yeah oh yeah he, people will kill us if we don't talk more about him but but anyway the uh that idea that you, that you create the dungeon, you're thinking about the ecology of the dungeon, you're thinking about the world that yep. you're building and who, what kind of hero, what I think it was, uh, what kind of world needs a hero like this? Yes. And so it's a very game design kind of way of thinking. Well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I tend to gamify anything. I just gamify, got the, gamify. Okay. gamify. While we were talking, that text that came through is a friend of mine who is one of the best game designers I ever met, a guy named Rob Fulop, who hasn't done a lot of stuff lately, but. I mean, he did, you know, half like, you know, like Missile Command and things like that, half of the arcade games people played, you know, in the early days. And then some really interesting multimedia projects and made a pile of money and sort of retired. But anyway, um, 
I was, it was just texting with him, you know, because we want to talk later on today. And I said, yeah, I got to go to the grocery store. <laughs> I was talking about, yeah, I, I kind of like going to the grocery store because it's one of the few things I do where it's just objective. I either got all the stuff or I didn't. You know what I mean? It's, you know, and, and I've kind of gamified it. Like if I have to go back, I get a one point for every item I pick up, two points if it's a hard item, you know, it's some rare tropical, you know, variant on yogurt that my wife's looking for that, you know, it's like, okay, this is the uh, semi-fat coconut milk, you know, I mean, if I, if it's something really hard like that, I get extra points and you have, and, and I realize, yeah, I, I, to me, everything is gamifiable. You know, I was just, just working on a uh, gamified uh, wine tasting game. Anyway, sorry, what, what, what were we talking about for that? Gamified oh, wine tasting game. Yeah, oh, yeah, because I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of excited. I mean, I'm really interested right now. I'm doing very, you know, most of what I'm doing is like small stuff right now, you know, and, and I, and I, that's because that's sort of what's interesting me. And I, you know, I'm trying to do all the projects that I didn't do well, you know, what, you know, that I haven't done over all the years that I've been doing the, you know, larger, more commercial things or the government stuff. Anyway, Gary Gygax. Yeah, I mean, you in the book, you're talking about how, for Batman, for example, since we've been talking about him, for that to really work, you have to have a certain kind of world. Yes, you need a world that needs you need a Batman. world where the needs of Batman. Same thing for James. The world for James Bond, very different. <laughs> well, yeah, you need a world, uh, you know, uh, you know where where you've got uh, you 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 need to deputize a guy with a license to kill to go around the world, steal the you know the main villain's girlfriend. You know, drive around in Aston Martin DB fives, and which is the only real Aston Martin. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, drive around in Aston Martin DB fives, and and uh, uh, you know, spend ridiculous amounts of money and and all that. I mean, you know, we read the Ian Flemings, and Fleming, you know, treats him kind of with quotes around this realistically from the point of view he is a you know government employee and stuff like that but by the time we got to the movies nobody wanted to see that you know, wanted to, nobody wanted to know the nuance of it they just wanted to see the the cars you know and and batman it's i mean you know james bond and batman are similar in the sense that that you you need you there is a certain joy and pleasure in in watching your good guys begin to be able to function like bad guys you know, James Bond's basically a professional killer. And that's okay because he's in a world where it's okay to be a professional killer because there's no other way to get these guys. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, yeah, that's that's what that was all about. Do you take the whole, we call it world building now. Nobody had that world back then, word back then. But it's world building. And sort of everybody was realizing at the same time. And you know, when Gary, in yeah, just his first sentence saying, the first thing you have to do is figure out the economy. It was, it was, it was a Gary at his most professorial and he was not, you know, there's nothing tedious or particularly professorial about him. He also was not a geek. That's the other interesting misnomer about him. But we're sitting there in this, uh, it, well, it's in the book, you know, we're in, the, we're in a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Okay, this is quite possibly the bungalow that Clark Gable and Carol Lombard were having their, you know, secret affair in. Okay, you know, this is about as hallowed and sacred of, of you know, Hollywood turf that there is. And it was Gary, you know, coming out trying to start the company, but also just trying to get out of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin and, you know, and his own issues in life. And, uh, but, you know, he was, I, he was sitting down. I don't know that Gary, I don't think he ever taught a class or had at that point taught a class in game design. And so I was kind of his first student. You know, Gary, Gary just, you know, I mean, I was helpful to him because I, as at that moment, an animation writer in the, the animated show, I could not work on it because I was on a contract at Ruby Spears, but, um, you know, I, you know, we breathed through him and, and Joe knew, Joe Ruby knew about that and he didn't care. You know, I, you know, I, it was, you know, cause it basically, I think, you know, I think most of these guys, you know, the Sunbow guys and Joe Ruby figured out, I was just this kind of virus that wandered around and, 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 you know, extracted ideas from everywhere he could find them and brought them back, you know, and, you know, I, mean, I pitched in, you know, people got stuff from me, I got stuff from, but anyway, so nobody cared. Um, but, and, and, and so Gary was, was doing it, you know, like it was a dress rehearsal for some book on game design that he was never going to write. Um, and, and sitting there explaining, but that was his first thing is, you know, you, you have to figure out the ecology of the dungeon, who built it and why, you know, what eats what inside the dungeon and, and all that. And I, re and, and I just tried, you know, took that into, into everything else that I, that, I, you know, I worked on, you know, it's like, okay, if, you know, let, you know, let's figure out, cause you can make an argument, even with the James Bond movie, 
that the movie's only as good as the villain's business plan. I mean, if you really think about the Bond movies, <laughs> Wait. I, I, it sounds cynical, but if you think about it, you know, I, like Goldfinger had a demented, but nevertheless, totally plausible, you know, business plan that he could articulate. Okay. You know, he was going to irradiate the gold. So his gold would be super valuable. You know, in all the early Bond movies, they had, they had good business plans, you know, and, and, you know, and that's part of what made the movies work. Um, you know, later on, you know, they, they just get, you know, kind of more and more, uh, you know, fantastical and, and, you know, boy, I feel like a real old timer saying that, but anyway, you know, you know, you know, kind of more and more fantastical and abstract and like, you know, how would this really work? And, and, you know, and, and lost some what they, what I thought that they had early on, you know, because Ian Fleming, I mean, if you read actually Ian Fleming stuff, it, it's fairly primitive and not, you know, not all that, I, I won't say not well-written, but I mean, you know, his, his genius was not as a, you know, sculptor of, of the English language or something. He was, you know, he told a really good yarn and he sort of invented a genre, which was really, um, I ago, went through and I read the Fleming books and the Hammett and the Chandler and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, well, well I, are you, have you ever listened to, uh, this is, this is, you know, just something to do for life. Um, there is an interview on the BBC. You can get on, you listen to it on YouTube now that is, uh, um, uh, you know, the, on YouTube now that is uh, an interview where, where Ian Fleming is interviewing Raymond Chandler. And what becomes evident is Ian Fleming is the ultimate Raymond Chandler fanboy. And you can look at James Bond after listening to that, realizing that what Ian Fleming did is he sort of married the English gentleman's, you know, mystery, you know, you know, English, you know, yeah, gentleman's adventure, you know, bulldog drum and stuff like that to the American hard boiled cop, you know, hard boiled private eye. And that's kind of what Bond is. I mean, and you, and you realize that, you know, that, what, you know, the analogy breaks, but if you think about it that way, it, it, and, and you listen to this interview, you realize, you know, cause I mean, you know, Ian Fleming's the straight man in the interview. I mean, that, that takes some doing right there, but you know, you know, Chandler sounds like he's drunk or maybe he just has a really, you know, you know, funky accent. He doesn't talk anything like I thought he would talk. Um, and, and, and you can tell, you know, Fleming just can't believe he's in the presence of his hero. It, it's, it's, it's something worth it listening to just for life. Well, that reminds me, I need to pick up your Agent 13 book. Oh yeah. Well, that was, that was Dave Marconi. Oh, I think there's that. It just, what? Uh, they did a, what do they call that? A print on demand version, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's print on demand version and they, they uh, a guy did do reprints on, I think, yes, I, and yeah, yeah, and that's the one to get now because the originals are hard to find. And Marconi and I keep talking about, hey, we got to do more Agent 13, but, you know, someday. Yeah, I want to get it more into that world of pulp. You know, I've read a lot of the Lovecraft and the Howard stuff. And Oh, I, yeah, pulps are the greatest the whole in the world. world there, I feel Wait, like. can you hang one second? Let me just go, go close the door and deal with the extrinsic thing. So put an edit point here for one second. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, I'll be right back. Pulps. Uh, yeah, that's my, there we go. Yeah, that's my favorite stuff. I mean, if I, if I, I mean, and that was, I think I talk about, I, 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 what's funny about writing a book is you forget what made it into the final version of it and what didn't. So, uh, so yeah, but I think it was in there. And, but if it's uh, redundant, just tell me. But um, what happened was I went to Comic Con. This is like the second time I went to Comic Con, right? You know, I've been there all but, you know, COVID years and I think two other years since 83. I'm going to talk about that at some point, too, because you've been there for, you saw it like evolve over a couple Oh, of years. yeah. I mean, no, incredibly, you know, from, and I, I kind of, you know, have liked most of the phases, but I mean, it's totally you know, transmogrified and evolved and become something different about five times. You know, in, in the early days, it was just, you know, because, you know, it, this all makes sense when you realize I was the least informed of anybody about, you know, I, I mean, except with one little quirk to it. And that is I knew about the really old stuff because of Buck Rogers. Right. You know, so, I mean, I was, I was, that was the one area I was not. Created Buck Rogers. Yeah. Yeah. My grandfather created that, but, and uh, which is the, you know, bane of my existence at the moment, but um, the, uh, um, you know, so, so I knew about that. I wasn't, I wasn't like, you know, as quite as ignorant as I act like I am, but I mean, probably pretty ignorant. 
and you know about comic books because I mean I just read them you know that you know I was like this generation when you got into high school you didn't read that stuff anymore not that I was worried about getting wedgies or anything like that but I mean it just you know I didn't go you know my high school didn't have you know wedgie environment and I was kind of big for wedgies but the point is is that um you know, yeah, you know, you just, it was just sort of an, uns, I mean, I think, I don't even think it was that unspoken. I think it was kind of spoken is all that kid stuff. You just parked it the minute you got to high school, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm now a guitar player in a band and, you know, <laughs> doing all, you know, high school things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and I mean, you know, I understood it. And I remember a guy who had been my patrol leader in Boy Scouts is seeing a, a Captain Action figure, a Green Hornet figure that they'd given me at uh, ABC because, you know, they, they, they were trying to buy Buck Rogers or do Buck Rogers at that point. They wanted sort of the fail the points, the, you know, attempts to do it. But anyway, and so we were in the office and, you know, the, the, um, you know, the kid was there. So they're giving me every piece of swag they can find. You know, probably clear out their offices, but I thought it was really cool. And so I'm sitting there with a Green Hornet doll, and this is now we've crossed the line into high school and being just mercilessly ridiculed by my friend who didn't care that, you know, I'd gotten it as, you know, a gift swag from whatever, you know, you know, uh, you know by my my patrol leader and uh, and and realizing, you know, you know, whether or not I cared what his opinion was, realizing that was the world I found myself in now. And so, OK, this isn't cool. We'll put this in the drawer. I, and that's one of the few things I didn't find. I think I may have actually gotten rid of it out of pure shame. But, the, you know, so, they, you know, that was, you know, that the context of that world. Um, I can't remember how we got there. Sorry, I'm not real linear. Uh, I think we're talking about pulp. Oh, yeah. So anyway, but it, when dad came out with his collected works of Buck Rogers, uh, which was, you know, a big deal, oddly enough, happened that summer. You know, I mean, you don't even know these, you know, seminal times in your life where, all sorts of unrelated things are happening, all of which will have a pro profound impact on you. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, he was doing, I came back, I remember coming back from Boy Scout camp and he was, you know, the, you know, all this stuff was laid out all over the living room floor and it was the, the manuscript from his book, uh, you know, what would become his, his book. Uh, and, uh, and that was the first time that, you know, you know, Brock Rogers came up, you know, full screen to me. Uh, but, the, at, at the same publisher, this this gets us to Paul. The same publisher did a book that season about um, called "The Pulps" by a guy named Tony Goodstone, and you know that we it was just lying around the house, and I started reading it. It was like, wow, I didn't even know people wrote stuff like this, and it's a pretty good representative picture of pulps from the crime pulps, which is what I would later get obsessed by, the sci-fi pulps to Howard and Lovecraft and. You know, and, and and all that stuff, you know, and I'd never even see, I, I didn't even know this existed. And I, I'm looking at it and it's like, wow, this stuff's just alive and it's fun and it's great. What is this stuff? And so cut to, you know, they just kind of, you know, not, you know, I didn't really follow up on it. I just sort of, it was just planted in my brain then. And then cut to, um, uh, you know, 20 years later, or yeah, probably about, oh, would they, 84? No, yeah, you know, about 15 years later. Uh, I'm sitting at Comic-Con and I find boxes full of these things. And you could buy pulp magazines then for like 20 bucks or 30 bucks. And, uh, and, and they, you know, there were things like Secret Agent X and the Spider. And I mean, I like the crime. They, I like the, the, the crime ones were the, the pulps went down this road. They were, they were, you know, semi-costumed and, you know, had, had plausible, but, you know, really would, would amount to superpowers. And, and what was interesting about it was that they, um, you know, that, you know, they were not, uh, you know, they would divide into, you in know, in, you know, inside probably 10 years into superheroes, which remember were printed, were basically printed like new Sunday funnies and were how comic books started. Right. Mm -hmm. And you had to have superheroes because the printing was so bad. You had to have a big ass on the guy's shirt so you could tell who he was. Right. right. And, and, uh, and the end to hard boiled detective stuff. And it would kind of like, you know, the, you know, Hammett and, and Chandler would go one way and, you know, uh, you know, some of the other writers would go the other way. Though comics weren't perceived as a writer's medium for a long time. They were much more like, you know, uh, comic strips at that moment. They're, they're treated much more like that. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I, so I, you know, I went out and, you know, I saw like boxes full of these things and I, you know, and I just like bought a bunch of them, like everything to look cool. And, and there, and, you know, I started reading them and I'm thinking, this is some of the best stuff I've ever read. And I'm trying to get a reality check, you know, and I, so, and a guy named Dave Marconi, who would later go on to write Enemy of the State and, and Live Free or Die Hard and The Foreigner. And yeah, he's still got a great career going. He was living on my floor at that exact moment. I, 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 you know, took him to, him. I, you know, I, I opened, you know, the pulps and I said, just take a look at one of these things. You tell me, I mean, are these things really good? Or am I just, you know, you know, you know, something wrong with me. And he looked at it and said, these things are great. Where'd you find, you know, and, and that's when we started writing agent 13 and, you know, we, we thought you know, when we originally created agent 13 as a movie pitch, because you know, at that moment he was, you know, kind of a hot screenwriter and I was doing Transformers and GI Joe, which was downright dis despicable and, or, you know, disgraceful and, and to be scorned. But um, mm -hmm. nevertheless, people were sort of beginning to understand that was actually a real business and people actually, you know, you know, the animation was, was, you know, ascendant. Um, but anyway, so you know, we, uh, we went out and we said the way we would tell, we never thought of it this way. You know, we didn't sit there and say, okay, we're going to do you know, Indiana Jones meets James Bond, but that's the way we thought of it in our heads because that's sort of what it was. And, um, uh, and, you know, and so we, we did the whole movie pitch. We made the run of the studios, had a lot of like kind of encouraging near misses, um, but the, you know there were serious meetings. I mean, you know, there was you know, it wasn't a complete flog of a meeting, and uh, um, you know we we realized okay we had to go you know we had to write these up as books, and at that point I had some silver bullet with TSR. I don't remember what that was, but point is it was okay. You know they let me write. You know they they would you know support my book writing effort. So Marconi and I wrote the first uh, three books. Or they, you know, the first two books, which were really supposed to be one book, and then they bundled them. Uh, they they split it in two, uh, which was kind of good because it was you know uh, a continuing thing. And then uh, um, I'm just going to show this real quick. Yeah, yeah, but you can show the Agent Thirteen stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's the modern reprint cover, and you know, I mean, that's you know, that's, they did a good <laughs> job of of you know putting together what you know. He had the ring that he'd burn, you know, you know, you can see the symbol burned into the guy's head on the top yeah. there. There's his girlfriend and she's kind of a, she, he met her and she was a mall for some mobster. And, you know, it's Maggie Dar. And you've got the brotherhood. He fled the brotherhood as a child because he was one of these prodigy kids who was, you know, you know, um, uh, you know, captured by the, by the brotherhood and, and, and he fled and they're still after him and he's trying to destroy him and, yeah, it's just great. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it, we just took. I mean, it was very much an '80s pastiche of every sort of pulp, you know, uh, you know, trope there was, but you know, kind of a, a you know a a good pastiche of them, I think. And uh, um, yeah, you know, and you know, it just it led us ultimately. Uh, a friend of mine, and now a friend, but at the time was uh, you know a, a terrifying studio executive. A woman named Bettina read him and she'd put us in. She was uh, the story editor at Amblin. And she put us in for writing the, uh, you know, the, what was then the next, going to be the next Indiana Jones film. Of course, what we know is no Indiana Jones film came out for 20 years. And, but that was kind of my introduction to Amblin. And, you know, until I met uh, uh, Lisa Henson, who, you know, and ended up writing Tiny Tunes there. Um, but it was why that was kind of a shoe in because Bettina had been a big fan of, uh, of agent 13. So, um, I don't know where, where, where did, the, where did I get off on that digression? I'm even less linear than normal. Today. We're just uh, talking about the, the world of pulp. I, one of the things. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, we, we just read this. We loved it. It was the freshest stuff we ever saw. You know, I've never like, you know, stop. And, and it tied into, uh, you know, because, you know, the Conan stuff, which is obviously sitting underneath the Sagard books that Gary and I did. Now, they originally they started out as Conan books, but uh, oh. uh, they, yeah, it was, that was for TSR. They uh, they but they did. They lost the license. I guess Gary was feuding with his partners at that moment. So, um, yeah, we had to, you know, we had to not have it be uh, Conan. So we got we you know made them the Sagard books um, and. Uh, is there a good? It's a good system that you came up with for those. For, yeah, I I, yeah. Oh, thanks. I'm not sure if people are familiar with these. I'm trying to find the. 
No, they're, they're, they're among the obscure things. However, um, Luke and I are talking, Luke Gygax and I are talking about reprinting them and we're trying to figure out, yeah, let's see English covers for them. The English covers I actually like more than the American covers, but yeah, those are the English covers there. So they're kind of like choose your own adventure books, but they, they have are a total choose your own adventure books. Game, yes. Uh, like a four sided die. Right. They're fight. I mean, what was different about them at the time was they're sort of fight your own adventure. You know, in other words, yeah, you, you know, you had fights and you had to decide do I stay in this fight or do I get out of the fight or you know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yes, they were. They were, you know, in the in the broadest possible sense, they were pick a path adventures. That, well, you know, we're on a on a path. Yeah, and then we had it where you could flip the pages. We printed the die numbers on the pages. And so you flip the pages to resolve combat if you didn't have, if you're, you know, I was thinking if you're on an airplane, plus the fact, I always thought four-sided dice look cool. So if you're, but if you're on an airplane, no you fun can to step the on. game. What? <laughs> no fun to step on. <laughs> yeah, no, and no, because they're pyramids, right? But, you know, and I wanted four-sided dice because if you, if you roll them on an airplane, you know, it, you know, they wouldn't spill all over the place because, you know, four-sided dice is the least likely to roll. And oh, we printed the numbers on that. Clever. Who would have thought of that? Uh, no, no, that was that was just my. You know, I just really, I, I just really liked four sided dice. You know, and and understood why because they're they're not a pain in the butt. You know, I, I mean, yeah, it's not some genius. It's just like, you know, yeah, this thing doesn't roll around and get lost the way all the other dice do. That was that was my uh, epiphany. But yeah, so so and then and also with the four sided system, you could reprint the numbers more times, so you could flick the pages and have you know have a better mathematical distrib uh, you know you know distribution. So yeah, so yeah, they, you know that was that was those adventures. And what I'm thinking now, I can't believe that that um, uh, Pick a Path Adventures haven't had a huge rebirth because of pads. I mean, you'd think of with tablets and things like that, that it's perfect for a pick a path adventure. And, and, and yet it doesn't seem they, you know, I'm sure people have done it, you know, and, you know, people have done everything, but you know, they, I, have, I haven't seen that stick out project. So uh, Luke and I have been talking now that he has the rights to, you know, do some of Gary's stuff. Um, uh, you ever R.A. R. A. Montgomery? What's that? You ever meet R.A. Montgomery? No, who's R.A. Montgomery? Uh, he was the choose your own adventure. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, no, I didn't know that. You know, it's, it, he I mean, passed away not too long ago, sadly, but. And he worked and uh, did he do like the uh, endless quest books or what, what did he do? What choose your, uh, choose, your uh, choose your own adventure. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, here's the thing. I mean, assume Maybe no on, expertise. There any, I don't think there wasn't like a game system here. The abominable, abominable snowman. Right. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. I mean, the, the assume I know as little as you could possibly know about most stuff and be me. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, it was stuff like that. It was just like, I just thought, oh, this is really cool. And, you know, but there wasn't that. Yeah. I, and this is not a good thing, but there wasn't that scholarly, you know, desire to know, oh, what's everybody in the field doing? There was no market research guy. I just thought, Oh, that's a cool idea. And I may or may not have ever actually played or read a, a Pick a Path adventure, you know, when I when I started Sagard. I just immediately sort of knew that's what this is. And which is, you know, to this day, the kind of game designer I am. And which is, yeah, as I said, not necessarily good, but you know, it's sort of it's a little bit fear of being prejudiced by what's already out there. And and a little bit uh um you know just the, oh i get it i get the idea i just want to go do it you know and i want to waste the time you know finding out you know what i'm knowing what i'm talking about basically is you know the, we talked about that a little bit in the in the book about how you didn't want to study the competition or you you know i don't know if that's more i don't want to be unconsciously influenced by it or i don't want somebody coming at me later saying i copied something or i, I you know the answer if if i'm honest is is probably predominantly a kind of laziness but it's it's not really just flat out physical laziness but it is okay i've got x number of hours to get this day you know to for this deadline am i, I gonna spend it researching somebody else's stuff or figuring out how to do my own stuff and i think where i talked about that the context of it in the book was was when i was talking about 
you know, when they moved me off GI Joe, which I just loved, I've never had anything be more effortless that I've ever worked on ever anytime for any reason than GI Joe. It just, you know, I, I, I just, you know, fell out of shoot knowing to do how to do that. I mean, that was, that was just, you know, I, we, Gerber and I looked at it as James Bond and, you know, I mean, Ron Friedman did an absolutely brilliant job on the pilot, um, you know, and, and it's set up, you know, on the, on the mini series that kicked it off and it set it up as this kind of, you set up all every element of it extremely deftly, but, you know, it, and then, you know, the, the temptation, well, I mean, you know, just the, the mission was, you know, you play it like it's military, right? And by the, but by the time Gerber and I, you know, got, got to it, it was like, okay, we've got, you know, 20 mil, you know, paramilitary feeling episodes. We're doing spy stories that just happened to have GI Joe in them. And, you know, and, you know, just cause we thought that was a lot of fun and that, you know, that got to our passion and it's, you know, it's a certain level, you know, you have to do stuff you like, or you're not going to be able not, you're not going to be able to do 65 episodes of it. Right. And, and mm-hmm. what? Oh, I just think that's one of the most fascinating things to me about this was, again, something I never considered as a kid watching these things. I didn't realize the sort of connections between the toys and the show. And like you said a couple of times, you were really an advertising or they considered you an advertising guy. Well, I mean, uh, Griffin Bacall, Sunbow, which I think they know, call it 22 which, minute commercials, I think. Was yeah, it was a was literally an ad agency. They were has ad ad executive. I mean, and and like when I was writing, rewriting the Transformer movie, you know, I was in New York for like a month and we'd rewrite, you know, I do, you know, kind of I, I've always gotten up earlier in the morning. So I'd be pretty much, you know, like done my stuff by, you know, noon. We'd go over, you know, Jay and I, Jay Bacall or Tom and Joe or whoever happened to be around that day we'd go over it and then you know often as not we go to lunch come back and then you know it's oh hey they're having you know an, a, a, a copywriting meeting you want to go in there i was like yeah okay i mean like all the best companies and and part of the secret sauce with sunbow was that you know you weren't really defined as anything you know i mean it's you know they i was just a writer but you know if they wanted to add copy hey, I'm, I'm i'm a copywriter you know if they want write the book you know i was i mean i was a, a an employee in Los Angeles and my job was to produce the shows. Okay. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's what I was, I wasn't something else, but um, you know, the, the, the general attitude, you know, their motto was everybody answers phones and the general attitude is you just went over and went in and did whatever it was that needed doing that day, which was, you couldn't get a better learning ground, you know? And you talked about how the, uh, you know, oh, those, those guys, those guys a, like a hierarchy guys. of creative people i guess i'm sure it still exists today but they considered you like the the lowest of the low because you're doing these uh transformers oh yeah when I, when I was doing the cartoons any kind of I mean, fantasy and stuff like of... that was you know considered lowbrow obviously people knew you know the commercial the overwhelming commercial success of star wars and things like that but you know yeah the animated car you know the cartoons were were you know considered disreputable but what was good about being disreputable was that you could actually get work because you know the you know all the swanky guys weren't gonna you know do these disreputable cartoons and you know and what nobody knew is we were paid shockingly well you know for doing them it wasn't like i mean it that 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 was like i you know that was one of the best best finance relative to uh, you know, to the fact that I had no expenses and I was basically still living like a college student when this all started. Yeah, that was probably the wealthiest I ever felt. You know, my mother came to do my taxes one year and it's like, you have to buy a house right now. We're going out and we're going to do something because you're going to get killed if you don't get some real estate. Yeah, yeah. I just wasn't aware of like the snob factor. Yeah, she said, like, <laughs> you, know, you, you had like $325,000 in your checking account. Do you understand that? And I said, yeah, I, yeah, no, I didn't because... What I knew was I wasn't going to be bouncing any of my checks because my expenses were about, you know, $5 a month. But uh, it, but I didn't understand the tax, you know, because doing my taxes before that had been a very uneventful, you know, unexciting uh, exercise for. Her. But that, at that time, she came in town and said, so, uh, no, sorry, what were you saying? Oh, I just like that. I wasn't aware of how much snobbery there was around those. Well, things. I mean, there wasn't really, I, you know, I mean, there was and there wasn't. I mean, I never, you know, it, but yeah, it was not, yeah, you know, it, you know, doing the car, the, you know, the animated shows, you know, Transformers and Joe and all that. I remember somebody telling me, remember, this is not Steven. 
but somebody when I was going to a- Amblin, you know, it, it, you know, get, getting ready to go meet Stephen, you know, was it was telling me, listen, don't, yeah, you know, don't mention the Joe and Transformers. <laughs> don't mention yeah, it. Don't, don't tell. You know, the, the irony is Stephen, oh. of course, ends up producer of the Transformers movie. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, so I mean, that was just, yeah, that was just kind of the, you know, the ethos. But it would be really easy to overstate that. But I mean, that yeah, that that was kind of like, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't talk about that. Um, and I didn't, you know, so that was uh, really. I mean, the things that's a couple of things that surprised me that I hadn't thought about until I read this were the again those connections between the toys and the show and the and the stories and the fans. You know, I was thinking like you talked about how the GI Joes when the the original ones were big, like yes. I guess they were called dolls, and like that wasn't some people were like this is not okay for a boy to be playing with a doll. Oh, that was that was you know my Talk mother who was. Yeah, my mother who was as non-interventionalist in these kind of things as you could. I mean, you know, that I mean, yeah, you know, I I was like had every learning disability you could possibly have when it came to learning how to read. So I mean, you know, they buy me anything, you know. They they, you know, I I, I probably would have bought me hardcore pornography if they thought I'd read it. But <laughs> no, that's not true. That's a big lie. But that, you know, the point is is that uh um you know, but the GI Joe, when she saw, you know, that I had this GI Joe, she looked at it and just saw a doll and I kind of mocked it, you know, which was very atypical of her. And, you know, I, I kind of listened to it. Okay. She's, you know, yeah, it is a doll. Okay. And, and, you know, and, and what they weren't like something I really wanted. And they were, you know, it, it, they were pretty expensive and, you know, it's like, hmm. um, but, but yeah, that, I mean, that, you know, they, you know, the, yeah, that was the, they were, it was not like now. You know, b- back then there was like the boys toys department, the girls toys department, and it was presumed, I mean, you know, absolute doctrine was, you know, you know, girl, uh, girls would may play with boys toys, boys would never to play with to- girls toys. Um, they, you know, I mean, it was just, it was just a lot of stuff like that, that, you know, were just rules that now you'd probably be arrested for thinking like that. But I mean, you know, that's that, you know, that was how it worked. You know, they, nobody saw it, Bromies coming. And but yeah, that, you, yeah, my mother's looking at it. You're playing with dolls, you know. So because doll. had, you could take the clothes, the clothes yeah. were like removable and it was bigger. So the yeah, no, it, was, was, it, it, was, it was created by Stan Weston, who was later our agent on Buck Rogers, one of life's little pieces of trivia. So the solution to that was just shrink them down to make them look more like the little war game miniatures, right? Well, and right. The clothes on, and now it's a whole different, it's an action figure now. <laughs> well, yeah, it looked like a toy soldier is what I mean. It toy was like soldier, a toy yeah. soldier. What? Yeah, the toy, it looks, you know, it's, it's just, you know, if it looks like a toy soldier, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's that's, that's totally no. fine. If I put a minute I'm sitting there, you know, putting pants on the thing, it looks weird to my mother. You know what I mean? And <laughs> and and to, you know, I'd say about half the you know guys I knew. And, you know, and as I said, that just wasn't, there was nothing really you know, pushing me in that direction, you know, you know, culturally or at the time, or, you know, I mean, it was, you know, it wasn't, I didn't have friends that were playing with them or anything like that. So it just, it just kind of flew by. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I, I probably like tried out pretty much every toy fad there ever was in that period, just because I was like, you know, a toy and rich kid, but, you know, it, it uh, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, it, you know, I just had, you know, I, I don't know that I call them indulgent, but I mean, they, you know, that, you know, my parents were, you know, you know, very generous. And so, you know, I had all sorts of stuff. So, you know, GI Joe's came and came and went, you know, very quickly, you know, the, the, the 12 inch tall ones, you know, cause they, you know, I wanted to have, I mean, in my orientation was I wanted to have, you know, giant armies of things and you, know, you could never afford a giant army of those names. Nobody could, you know, and, you know, and, and so, you know, they, they wouldn't really serve my, my, you know, you know, toy needs. Was kind of yeah, you know, beginning, middle, and end of my attitude towards it. I, just, I love thinking about those connections. Of, like the the trans. Yes, no. It, the shows thing. were all about selling toys. I mean, and you know, and that wasn't like some secret knowledge. That was like, you know, hey, you know, and, and because the part of what ended the toy era was the was legislation that basically said you you uh, you know cannot you know advertise you know. You, you, I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out exactly how it was phrased, but you could not like, you know, advertise your own toy in a show that is about your toy, because, you, you know, you think about it a lot of times with licensing and merch, 
it's a hard line to know whether you're licensing in or licensing out. In other words, you know, if, if, you know, somebody does a GI Joe TV show, is that, you know, is that benefiting? Is it, are you selling the TV show or are you, you selling the GI Joe? And the genius of those shows was that the, yeah, both. Right. You know, they, uh, you know, and, and you, you gave meaning to the fantasy and then the, the, the brutal irony and the bad experience. And there was Masters of the Universe, I think, started this. We sure as hell didn't start it. But um, the brutal irony was that then you would, you would have people, they would have to advertise inside the television shows of their competitors. Okay. And you think about it, if you, you know, if you're some, you know, you know, uh, you know, ad guy or, or competing, you know, a company that's, that's doing those shows, you just think you got them coming and going. And they did. It kind of reminds me a little bit. I don't know how much overlap there is, but you know, there's a lot of concern these days about these games like Minecraft. I don't know about Minecraft, but Roblox comes to mind. I think Fortnite. There's a couple other ones that have the, there's things in the game for the kids to buy. Yep. <laughs> you know, a lot of parents, I guess, are like, we're kind of concerned about those. Well, because well, most of those games, are, I mean, here's the, here's the gag is People can act concerned about that all day long, but that's why the game's free to play. And you know, you know, the, you know, I don't care how sophisticated the world gets. You know, some you know some rules don't change, and that is, you know, you know, you know, nothing in life is free, right? So you're going to pay for it somehow, okay? And so you know, their thing is get you addicted to the game. And I, I'm not an enemy of this. I'm not saying this, you know, disparagingly, but you know, yeah. Um, you know, get you addicted to the game and then you pay. I mean, that was, you know, that was, you know, Niantic's model with Pokemon Go. And, you know, it said that is, you know, really in-app purchases are the way to go. And, you know, it, I mean, because one of the, the, I think one of the bad things about the internet is it, it, it convinced people they didn't have, that everything things were free and they're not. You know, I mean, you know, if, you, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, as somebody put it to me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, your data and your, you know, uh, you, you know, all that stuff when they say, we're concerned about your privacy. I mean, you can believe that if you want to. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I mean, that's, you know, that's that, you know, what that's what it's really about, you know, is, is, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know, either, you know, either you're selling your data or, you know, there's, there's some model in there that's, that's sustaining all this. Is I guess what I'm trying to say. We get time for a couple more. Sure. Yeah. I'm not, no, I mean, you, you call me on this nothing of a day. My, oh, uh, go out okay. do the, all good. sorts of errands after this. So I'm more than happy to hang out. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but yeah, yeah. We're, we need to get, there's a couple of things I wanted to get to. We haven't talked about it at all. Sure. Health things at least I would go on all day, but, uh, I, I want to hear a little bit more about the Coleco Adam. Okay. The, uh, okay. Yeah. It's, a it's, a system. it's a big deal, you know, for a lot of computer game uh, connoisseurs, you know, they're kind of intrigued yep. by that. And you're somebody that's got some experience with it. Well, I mean, I, I have a very limited, very specific experience with the Coleco Adam. What happened was that um, we made a deal with Sega. Uh, it was a Buck Rogers deal. And it was really, it was, it was, it was a real important deal to me because, you know, it's like, you know, I've been leeching off my parents and you know, at this point I'm in my twenties and, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we went out and we got this deal and uh, it was for a lot of money. And, and, uh, I felt like, Oh, I partially paid them back, you know, and I felt like less of a parasite. So anyway, so, uh, yeah, there we are planet of zoom. Okay. So we made the deal with Sega that, uh, and the Coleco Adam was going to be the big thing. It, you know, it was a console, you know, like a, and in television, which was the, you know, the most obvious, you know, analogous competition at that moment. It was like, it was like an television, and it was also, you could use it as a computer. So it was killing two birds with one stone. Am I, is, see what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, because then, you know, there, computers and consoles were two different things. Now they were merged for the first time, you know, in one, you know, under one roof. And, and it was a tape-based system, I believe, because this was before CD-ROMs. Or, but I don't even think it had floppies. I think it, it, was a, it was a cassette tape, but it looks like a floppy drive in there. And there may have been different iterations of it. But it was the next big thing. And, and we made our deal for, for, with uh, Sega for uh, a game that would, would come to market as Planet of Zoom. 
Okay. And, you know, it actually, and the game was actually a good game, but it was, it was funny about it. Our use for it was I had like a, a standing risk game that went on for 10 years. And if you lost, <laughs> you would, you would, you would go to the planet of zoom, which meant you're out there playing that game, you know, you know, and that's, that was like this mark of shame, you know, that, you know, you'd lost the risk game. So you're, 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 you're at the planet of zoom. Um, yeah, because people literally go out and play Planet of Zoom, you know. I think were. it's a fine game. I've played it. Yeah, no, it's actually a really good, you know, it's one of those waves and rows of of things that you shoot. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, the world's most, you know, innovative gameplay, but it was a well-executed, good game. And uh, um, yeah. so, yeah, you know, but what happened is the year it came out, and I remember we went to, you know, it was a big deal, and we went to the, arcade you know fa- uh, you know in those days they had like a you know convention for everything kind of like now but they were much more they were the conventions were much more sort of you know you know specific and we went to the video game arcade c- convention in chicago because chicago is where you know a lot a lot of the companies like midway and things like that were, were chicago companies or pinball companies that turned into arcade game companies and um and it was the year the bottom fell out of the market. I mean, you know, arcade games were the hottest thing in the known universe. And then all of a sudden, yeah, I, it was the first time I ever, I ever experienced that was just the collapse of an industry, which would become, you know, you know, de rigueur for the, for the video game business. But we didn't know that at the time. And when you showed up and there was just this feeling of, you know, it's over. And I, you know, it was something I couldn't have articulated you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, why I felt it, but it was palpable. And, uh, you know, but anyway, we got our money, uh, I, you know, in front. But, the, you know, it was just and, and pretty much the, I, I think it would be fair to say the arcade industry never really recovered from that. It was, it was never quite the same again. Um, you and, uh, you get a print out of the Saturday morning cartoons and like most of it, most of the cartoons coming out at some video game or arcade. Oh, game. yeah. When I was working at Ruby Spears, I mean, we did uh, Pen- uh, Pengo, we did uh, Donkey Kong, we did, um, Tet- uh, did we do Tetris? Not Tetris, we did um, Rubik's Cube, which was different. Um, it, no, they, I mean, it, they they were what Joe Ruby referred to as the golden ashtray. And the golden ashtray, you know, in his parlance was whatever the networks really wanted that year. You know, they, you know, whatever license that was the hottest thing in the world. And one year it was video games, actually for a couple of years. And we, we sold like five and a half hours on Saturday morning. I don't think anybody ever had ever done that before or since, you know, that was a, that was a very big deal for us. But yeah, that was, you know, but it, you know, it, it all sort of abruptly ended and, um, uh, you know, that, that, that was it, you know, it was, yeah. I think one of your next uh, foray into games was it the Sega CD stuff? Uh, yes, that that was my first foray into video games. So this you was know, I've been doing Sega all the TSR CD. stuff. What? Yeah, it was the. I'm trying to get. I had a list here. The, the yeah, double yeah, it was, it, well, surge, corpse killer, surgical strike. Yes, uh, uh, but the the big one, the one, that, the one that, that kind of the you know to the center on for that conversation is. Um, a thing called double switch. I mean, I was there, the guy I was just talking about who I was texting about, you know, turning uh, shopping into a game, Rob Fulop had done, I believe he worked on uh, Night Trap, which was the oh. you know, really controversial one. Joe yeah. and, and, you know, what's his name, Marky, you know, they were like waving around in Congress, you know, how this yeah, is doing all the wrong sort of PR, I guess. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, just horribly misrepresenting what the product was. And I, I had very little to do with that. I showed up in like the last 10 minutes of that. But, um, yeah, you had all these, you know, these you know, preposterous characters of the 80s who were like, you know, defenders of children and stuff like that, you know. Um, and, and, you know, and that was, you know, that was you know, big bank back then to, to be able to be, you know, Joe Lieberman and, and wave that around. I was trying to think of the name. Yeah. Joe Lieberman was the, the, I mean, he later, you know, ran, he was, uh, um, vice presidential candidate with, uh, no, uh, let's see with, um, wasn't he, didn't Lieberman? Yes. God, how can I forget this stuff? Like Al Gore or somebody, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, look up his campaign, but I think, 
I mean, he went on to have a big career. And, and boy, I, I, you know, I'm having, I'm having a bad moment here. I'm uh, trying to remember exactly what, what it was, but I, I think he was a VP candidate with, uh, it was Gore Lieberman. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I'm not wrong about that. I'm not going crazy. <laughs> Vice president. Um, but I mean, how quickly we forget, you know, but I mean, this is like, you know, he was, he was the, uh, you know, the candidate in the, you know, the hotly contested recount, you know, yeah, in Al Gore. Florida, you know, all that, that uh, Joe Lieberman was Al Gore's running. Mate. So, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, this, this stuff got him a lot of attention and we as part of, I don't, I don't know, there was, you know, singularly his crusading on behalf of our children that did it but i mean he was you know he would he became a very real guy in american politics and uh um and and was you know the probably the most intrepid trepid anti you know video game crusader there was that was that i think that would be a fair and honest statement was uh, interesting. I, I mean there had been some controversies before with that you know of course you would know the i think oh I, yeah no the, the, no they're definitely game, but i mean this was i think what got this so uh captivating to people that didn't know what was going on was just like oh there's actual video with live actors and things and that's oh yeah no that was the secret sauce of night trap and it was live video and you know they sort of horribly misrepresented what was going on in the screen but you know i could see where they do it and everybody knew they were releasing into that market and that in itself was its own question because you know some of the best pr you could have was have all the you know, the, uh, you know, sensors and all that out there trying to get you banned. I mean, that's just straight PR, right? Uh, you know, so, I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a mixed blessing and there was a certain amount of cynicism on both sides, but um, yes, that was, uh, you know, that, that was uh, Joe Lieberman and uh, uh, I, I, well, Thomas Markey. I mean, he's a democratic, uh, you know, congressman from Massachusetts who may still be there or, if he isn't, he just retired. I mean, some of those guys never go away. But yeah, there was there was a conga line of of you know you know you know, protectors of children who became pretty much nemesis of everything we did, unless we just look at it as yeah these guys are giving us free publicity. That would be the other way of looking at it. And you know, depending on how how you want to look at it, that's this was it the steam tunnels and steam. Well, tunnels. that was that's what put D and D on the map. Okay, I mean, here's the other weird thing okay we're talking about alternate reality games earlier mm -hmm. right okay the other weird thing was this is people yeah i and this flies in the face of what i was saying about you know understanding you know knowing less and understanding more people believe things that you know on the face of it it's like i mean you know the steam tunnel story was very much in flavor and tone and rumor you know urban you know folklore exactly the same as the dungeon and dragon controversy about remember the kid who went into the yeah well no dungeon and dragon was kid who, uh, i'm sorry dungeon and dragon was the kid who went into the steam tunnels allegedly because he was playing this weird game that involved going into secret tunnels and all that and he went in there and never came out and you know and that was the the rap on dungeons and dragons and the you know the implication being this will happen to your children if you let them play this game this evil game uh, yeah, of course, the truth turned the out. The cards would scream when you, or the book. Oh, yeah, well, that was, okay, that was the other half of the censorship thing. Oh, okay, yeah. half of it was, um, uh, you know, anti-violence people, and half of, and half of what was, well, there, there were sort of three legs to it. Uh, you know, it's anti-violence, then it was the religious guys, because remember, that was that was an era when there were all those, you know, TV evangelists and everything, and they had to have something to swagger and people like that. Yes. And so, you know, and so they were going after that. Uh, and then there were the um, there were people that just generally offended that, you know, their you know, kids were being having toys marketed to them and games and all that on television. And, you know, the jackbooted octopus of capitalism was, you know, you know, destroying our children or something. Yeah, you know, I mean, there was this just that general philosophical problem. Then there were the anti-violence people, and they came in two forms. There's Peggy Charon, who was action against for children's television. Uh, and uh, you know, and and she went after pretty much, I mean, between her and Thomas Radecki, they went on after pretty much everything you liked and everything I worked on. You know, uh, and uh, Thomas Radecki, Gary and I, Gary Gygax and I were on a uh, 
a show, Michael Jackson show, not Michael Jackson, the singer, Michael Jackson, the LA radio personality. Huh. We were on that show and Thomas Radecki called to, you know, wail on us and talk about the evils of Dungeons and Dragons and all that. He, of course, ended up turning out to be a perv and uh, you know, is in jail, I think, at this moment or went to jail for some kind of sexual misconduct. Just look up Thomas Radecki. Uh, Peggy Charon, who ran Action for Children's Television, Joe Ruby one time asked her, he said, OK, if you get everything you want, will you just like go away? And she said yes. And she got everything she wanted and she went away. I don't think that's ever happened with a pressure group ever before or since. Um, and then Lieberman and Markey jumped in on it. Really, I think they were more video games. I don't think they had much to say about the animated shows, but they were, you know, the violence in video games. And then and Night Trap, I mean, Night Trap was a goofy comedy starring Dana Plato. You know, look up, you know, Google her and build. that's a whole story in itself. Uh, and uh, and I think my friend uh, John Platten worked on that too, and Jim Riley and Rob Fuller. I mean, a whole cadre of people. What's interesting about that is those projects were originally done for Hasbro, believe it or not, and because Hasbro had a company called Isix. And the one and the only time I actually met um, um, Stephen Hassenfeld was in the break room at Isix, which was up in Silicon Valley. And what they had is they had a device that would read four tracks on a VHS tape and was able to jump between the four tracks. And that's what the first projects were. That uh, the first part the first projects were these very thin games, you know, the yeah, video type games, but they're lock and unlock and you know and all that. But at certain if you unlock certain things, it would trigger a video. Hmm. And and the VCR would know you had to store the whole game in RAM. So that tells you how big you know the games were. But the VCR, uh, VCR would then know what track to jump to and play that track. And then you had to elaborately on flowcharts figure out how to sequence the track so it would tell the story. And that's what, and, and so that's what Night Trap was. Then the one I, the first one I worked on was Double Switch, which is, it's, it's worth taking a look at some playthrough of it on YouTube. We had Debbie Harry in it, that would be Blondie, right? This is a very big deal, you know. It's like, wow, Blondie's in my game. Um, and Corey, Corey Hyam was in it, and Mary Lambert, who directed Pet Cemetery, which is and still, to my, in my opinion, one of the best Stephen King movies, directed it. And and uh, um, yeah, it was the whole it was just a really good experience, you know, I, all the way around. And you know, and I wrote it uh, and did say I wrote it and did some design on it. Uh, you know, you could say I was a designer on it. I mean, because what's really funny is part of what happened to me career wise after all this is I decided, you know, I, you know, I really want I love writing movies. I'm never going to stop doing that. But right now I want to focus on games, you know, and, and it's going to surf between the two, because at that point was the first time you could ever actually make your you know, living writing for video games was when that video came out. And, and you know, and basically my agents were saying, you know, let me explain something to you. You know, the agents always talk to you like you're 12 and, you know, not at a point. Um, and, you know, but, um, you know, they, they, you know, let me explain something to you. And that is, I can either go out and bill you as a, you know, game designer, which you are. But if I do that, you're going to, you know, I, I, you know, I, you're going to get, you have to stay there, work at the company, be a game designer. Or I bill you as a writer who's writing movies for Steven Spielberg and you get paid 10 times as much money, get to do this, the same stuff and you're not pinned down to the project. So you can do a bunch of stuff, which is what I always wanted to do anyway. You know, so, but I mean, that, you know, that was, I mean, because, I mean, so and whatever, whatever it is you, you know, you're kind of billed as is what how people will perceive you. And and it was also good being a designer and being a writer, not a designer, because at that moment that's changed. You know, now everybody has chat GPT, so everybody's a writer. But uh, at that moment, you know, it, you know, that was still considered a deal deal, you know, element because you know, you know, uh, you know, poly, I mean, the game business was following, you know, Hollywood models and you know, sort of Hollywood thought process. It, it was called it was when Silicon Valley met Hollywood and they called it Sillywood, right? And uh, which is, you know, their worst names, uh, and, you know, but anyway, so, you know, whether or not, you know, I, you know, whatever I, I however I wanted to think about myself, uh, of myself, 
you know, it, it, there were all sorts of vested interests that wanted me to think of myself as a as a writer and not a game designer because it was simply the the scarcer and, and more valuable skill. And sure. at that point, you know, I had like agency agents and real agencies representing me in games, and and you know, and and you know, you know, we're adults here. That was you know, that's about money. And so, you know, they, you know, I would be encouraged to make the, the smarter financial decision. And the, the truth is they were right. You know, and, you know, I mean, sometimes I regret it now because it, you know, nobody thinks of me as, as a, I, 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 you know, regret it with a small R. Nobody thinks of me normally as a game designer, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I designed a lot of stuff, but you know, that's just not the way it was sold and then the way it was pitched and, you know, what I was there doing. But it also allowed me to work, work on a lot more stuff, which is what I always wanted to do. Yeah, credit for 40, on 47 games. 47 games. Well, I mean, send me that link. I've never seen anything that said I did 47 games, but that is true. Just but I mean, not, you know, like on IMDb, is, you know, it's gotten better, but it's traditionally been very spotty as to what, you know, what actually you know, gets recorded and what doesn't get recorded and what shows up there. Yeah, so send me that link. That's a great link to have. Yeah, the Chronicles, uh, Chronicles of Riddick. Yep. Chronicles of Riddick was one of those really great, important career projects that I didn't see coming. I mean, that was, you know, the first time I ever did anything with Ben. And uh, which is, you know, that has been, I mean, we haven't done anything in a while. I, I got to get hold of him. Um, but, you know, it was, you know, just a great relationship and some funny adventures there. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, like four or five of them. And, you know, the writing was good. You know, I, I think I had four or five times, depending on what you count. Um, I've had game of the year and then uh, or script of the year or whatever. And uh, people saying that they liked the game better than the movie. Well, I mean, what's really funny is the game and the movie were not totally unrelated in that, um, you know, we, we you know, the, Vin had rejected the first the first game script. You know, I mean, Vin is is an actual real deal, no nonsense, you know, gamer. OK, he's not he's not one of these guys that, you know, is kind of a dilettante that shows up and pretends to be a gamer. He's a real deal. And uh, for whatever reason, he didn't like the script he'd gotten. And so a, a guy named Kaz Lazarus, who, you know, I did a million projects with over the years, um, called up and said, hey, can you come in on Riddick and, you know, he'll, and bail us out. And, and so John Platten and I went over jzp as he's now known uh, uh uh and i went over and and worked on it and it was just it was just a great experience it was one of those times you know those periods of your life you know where nothing goes right and then there are the other periods of your life where you know you, no matter you know what happens you can't lose that was one of those yeah, and enjoy them when you have them yeah <laughs> I know both of those situations. Quite yeah, you know, they're just like, you know, sometimes no matter how, you know, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I was like, you know, whining about, you know, you know, various things I'm working on right now, just being in frustrating points, uh, you know, and I was saying, you know, well, if I was a pair, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, was kind of having this conversation with myself, which is pretty boring. You have to figure out when to change the subject and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not angry yourself, but um, no, I, uh, you know, I was, I was like, you know, you know, realizing, okay, if I was a pair of dice, I wouldn't be like bummed out that I, you know, rolled snake eyes three times. That's just how it works. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. And, and that was, a, you know, was the, the entire VIN thing was just something that just sort of kept working. You know, I mean, you know, we, we were the right people walking in the right door on the right day for the right reason. And, uh, you know, and then we we did a bunch of stuff and wrote uh, several drafts of a Hannibal movie. Even even started and you know it it just it never you know came to fruition for a variety of reasons. But uh, um, uh, a biopic about Gary Gygax, because um, yeah, Vin Vin's a hardcore gamer, and uh, um, so yeah, yeah, that's that that was a lot of fun. But yeah, Riddick. Uh, you know, Dan Airy brought me in on Uncharted just because they wanted to, you know, that he had most of the stuff, you know, and it was, you know, and, and you know, I mean, Uncharted is pure, he, you know, he, I believe he's undercredited on that game because, you know, because that went on to be a series and all that. But, you know, that's just pure Dan Airy stuff, you know, yeah, Drake's fortune. On. And uh, I have some ridiculous credit in there. I think it's now just on IMDb as a writer, but it's some, it was some 
something like that the lawyer made up and you know it's kind of this you know it's kind of this like sarcastic you know okay well let's say this you know and it was really funny you know when we were talking about it but it looks very funny when you you look at contract later on but i think imdb just credits me as a writer um you know a writer i mean there are a lot of a lot of people worked on that and did great work i mean you don't get something that good without a lot of people doing a good job but uh um yeah my particular focus was just make it as a franchise that sony could then make into a film which they finally did it took a while but they finally did it um themes in the book that stood out to me was just how hard it is or you know if you don't know any better you look at these credits and you think that must be a straightforward you know agreed upon process when it's really kind of no. gets messy and who really no. knows who did what and well and because because look you know it, it, with stuff like like games you know if, if we're honest about it games are an incredibly collaborative process just by their very nature and uh and that means and if you have a hit that means everybody did a good job yeah and and you know it, it is it is you know yeah i mean you hate seeing these kind of you know squalid you know squalid squabbles you know between with between people but you know that's just human nature this is what happens um, you know, and, and fighting over credits and all that, and you know, because there's, there's, you know, there's plenty of credit to go, you know, you know, there should be plenty to go around because, you know, that, I mean, yeah, if something's good, that means, you know, everybody hit, hit their marks on the same day, which is, you know, says a lot for the executives. It says a lot for the creative says a lot for everybody. And, you know, I don't understand the stinginess, but you know, that happens. I I think we've covered a whole bunch of ground here. Yes. Yeah. I know. I, I mean, I'm one thing is, I got to ask one extra thing, though. We haven't talked about sure. Garbage Pail Kids. <laughs> uh, okay. What do you want to know about Garbage Pail Kids? Uh, garbage Pail Kids. I love those. Parents hated them. Yeah. I don't know that anybody really, you know, hated them. I mean, you know, I mean, Garbage Pail Kids were like, the sort of weird thing that you yeah, worked at Coleco, well, you know, I guess you had some experience with, with that Coleco Adam, same company, right? That did the Cabbage Patch dolls. Well, yeah, but I mean, it, you know, it, it certainly wasn't any of. The, I mean, it was for me. It, they were totally unrelated experiences. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, it, I mean, it's like I never knew anybody at Coleco when we were doing. You know, we did the Buck Rogers deal. I just knew people at Sega, and and. Uh, uh, and yeah, Coleco had, you know, you know, morphed into something else in the meantime, but um, yeah, so Garbage Pail Kids were a phenomenon, you know, not the world's biggest phenomenon, but they were a phenomenon. And in, you know, I would say in exactly that period, you know, the <laughs> mid 80s. Yes. And being a kid, we the kids, you know, we'd all sneak these into, into class and the teachers are forbid them. They, they would destroy them if they caught you with them. They really offended people, you know, and I and I never really got it. I mean, there were just, you know, it was uh, Art Spiegelman, wasn't it? The guy who did Mouse and did. Uh, I don't know it was the same, the, the Mouse guy. Yeah, right. And Mad Magazine. I mean, you know, that that's what that stuff is. And Mad Magazine was the thing. Everybody forgets this. But Mad Magazine was very controversial, too. Mm -hmm. And like that was one of the things my parents would let me read and other parents would be saying, you know, you can let, you know, Flint read what, you know, he wants to, but. You know, don't don't have him bring Mad Magazine over to our house. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I looked at you, really? And my parents looked at it and kind of were like, really? Well, you know, so as I said, you know, in my particular case, I just, just such a defect that, you know, I, I had a lot of, you know, reading and learning difficulties that, uh, you know, I was dyslexic and had mixed dominance and, you know, just all sorts of problems that, you know, that if I would read something, they didn't care what it was. You know, I mean, you know, that was, you know, that was how, how they perceive the gravity of the situation. I mean, you know, that um, I was joking about the hardcore pornography, but I mean, you know, that, but I mean, you know, they, you know, they encouraged anything would buy me. If I showed any interest in it, they'd buy me mad magazine, not a problem, you know, the, anything just to, to have me not, you know, hate reading. So anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's Art Spiegelman. And so I never looked at that as particular, but you know, it's it's easy to forget that there was a time. Yeah, Mad Magazine was a controversial thing, and um, you know, I, I mean, you know, it's it's like you know the bizarro world of, version of today. But you know, and and, and you know, the, and so Spiegelman, his entire career was doing controversial things. I mean, Auschwitz stories about you know 
mice was not the most normal thing for somebody to be doing in, in the world. But you know, we look at it as normal and we you know take it for granted now, but that was different then. Um, Teach that. And, uh, um, so, all right, and, but garbage PL kids was not, you know, didn't have the pro problems for, you know, for mouse reasons. It just was, you know, offensive and, you know, it, it was deliberately and intentionally offensive. I mean, let's be honest, you know, and, and uh, I, however, I think that opportunistic, you know, do-gooder groups, you know, you know, saw stuff in, you know, intentionally saw stuff in there that wasn't necessarily there. I don't think they're making fun of handicapped people because there's like no real condition that ever appears in garbage bail kids. But it was the beginning of people get, you know, and that, that's what was, you know, the cultural disconnect, which is not, you know, alien to us in, in 2023, but, you know, was not normal in, in, you know, in the eighties is, was that, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, getting, you know, getting offended, you know, didn't have a, con you know, a currency back then, you know, and now it does. And, you know, and, and it all started sort of when people realized they could get a lot of attention and, you know, and in fact, money for being offended, you know, and that's, you know, and that's kind of what, you know, you know, garbage pail was, I mean, you know, was anybody really bothered by it? I don't know. You know, I mean, I, that's not knowable, but, but it certainly seemed like people were getting a lot of mileage off it. Anyway. So I mean, yeah, yeah, so that's, what that's happened? Really gross, or that's really disgusting. But I mean, I, yeah, well, we're right. But I mean, it was you know, I mean, since when is kids, I thought it's hilarious. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> since when is kids liking disgusting toys like some shocking you know piece of news? You know, I mean, they they kind of always have. I mean, you know, that's that's you know, and it, and it, you know, I, I mean, it's you know, I, I mean, you know, young boys are you know obnoxious creatures and i don't know that garbage pail was I, I don't know anything about the you know marketing demographics on it or anything but you know it was you know you know it was it was a disgusting toy you know or product you know that you know intended to be a disgusting product i mean it wasn't you know like they were like somehow hiding this from anybody and and you know well, it's perfect it, for me it had, kind a, of it had a sister that. like i did who was a little bit younger than me that was really into the cabbage patch dolls well, they were. I'm sorry. Really you're right. Well, I can show her these. <laughs> they were. They were a reaction to the Cabbage Patch dolls, which people found just kind of annoying. And, and you can oh, you yeah. can see where a guy like Art Spiegelman, who spent his whole life doing satire, right, is looking at the Cabbage Patch dolls and going, "Oh man, you know, yeah, yeah, I got the Garbage Pail Kids," and and it was absolutely brilliant. And they were a hit. And you know, they were one of the last. No, that's not true. I was going to say they're one of the last trading card hits, so it hits, but that was that's far from true. But the last, you know, trading card non gaming uh, hits. But anyway, um, and so yeah, uh, you know, yeah, their their reaction to, you know, to Cabbage Patch Kids and and you know, and but they're, they're by and large just like you know, big stupid funny Mad Magazine things. So one year they were the golden ashtray, and it happened to be the year that uh, the Transformer movie came out. And now we all may remember the Transformer movie, you know, fondly and, and all that. But at that exact moment, um, you know, Hasbro was very upset. You know, like, I mean, there, there were people, you know, acting like we had unilaterally decided to kill Optimus Prime. And, and you know, and no shows were ordered. And so it was pretty evident to, to you know, to everybody that, you know, oh, that era is coming to an end, you know, that, you know, and. You know, as it happened, just in one of those lucky moments, um, a guy named Michael Chase Walker, who had been a producer on, um, uh, what do you call it, the Peter Beagle book, uh, Last Unicorn, uh, and then, and and had discovered Pee Wee Herman, interesting week for that conversation, um, uh, you know, called me up and said, hey, we want you to come over to CBS, we're doing an in-house version of, of Garbage Pail Kids, meaning in-house, meaning it's actually being produced by CBS. And they brought me in, uh, you know, to, and, and so, you know, and he asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, because I knew, you know, the Sunboat, you know, that was, you know, that era was ending. It was, it was just happening. And, and I went to Joe and Tom and I said, hey, you know, I know we don't have any shows picked up. If we do, I'll come back. But they want me to come over and develop this thing. And, you know, and, and you know, frankly, you know, Joe and Tom were, you know, kind of enlightened sorts of characters, uh, you know, the Sunboat guys, you know, in the sense that they knew that my going over and working on a thing for, you know, they knew I was like, you know, not going to abandon them um, working on a thing like garbage pail kids would extend, extend their reach to the networks too. So it was kind of win-win for everybody. They didn't have to, 
<clears throat> make some rough decision on whether to keep us all on the payroll or, or keep me on the payroll, you know, and, and I didn't have to, uh, you know, make a rough decision on, you know, am I going to leave Sunbow to do this because we know it's over, you know, and it, it was good. It was good business for everybody. So uh, I, you know, so I, I took the job, I went over there and this was probably winter, I would say winter of 87 because 87 sort of the year, you know, the Transformer movie comes out in 86. You know, probably Michael Chase Walker gets hold of me somewhere in winter of 87 and, and we go over to do it. And, and Judy Price, who was, you know, one of the just, titans of saturday morning i mean she, you know judy price was you know i i mean you know there were like three people who were you know don you know who controlled saturday morning and judy price was one of them and she was producing it i had never worked with her I, you know I, I you know i knew about her and you know had kind of been in the orbit for a long time but i just had never you know i didn't work at network because you know i went to lucasfilm and then sunbow so i never didn't work at network for a long time and I didn't understand, you know, and, and I mean, it's now obvious, but I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, you know, I didn't understand that, you know, sort of the antipathy there was between the Saturday morning people and, the, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of, they, they just had kind of an attitude towards syndication, you know, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is, you know, it, it kind of almost put them out of business. Um, but nevertheless, you know, she went along with Michael Chase Walker, and then he subsequently left CBS. And so I was sitting there, but I had, I had just a great staff. I mean, when you look at what people went on to do, um, Linda Wolverton came out over with us and she, you know, would later, you know, go write Beauty and the Beast and Lion King and Maleficent. And I mean, yeah, she's the highest grossing writer in the history of the Writers Guild at this moment. Um, and, uh, and so she came over and, and Roby Gorin, who had been a laugh in writer. You ever heard of LeBron and Martin's laugh in? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I, you I know, I, it I don't up, look it up in your funk and wagnalls. Huh? Yeah. Look it up in your funk and wagnalls. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, uh, Roby was there and Gordon Kent, who is probably the most versatile person. He wrote a lot of stuff on Joe and Transformers and, and but he was also an, an he knew also knew more about animation and all that, you know, than anybody. I mean, certainly, you know, than I did, but you know, everybody kind of deferred to him because he was just, he, I mean, he knew the process, he knew the players, he knew the history, he knew the lore, he knew it all. Anyway, so Gordon Kent came over and, and we had a really good staff, but it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, Tolstoy, it's, you know, all happy families are the same and all unhappy or unhappy for their own reasons. And that kind of turned into an unhappy family pretty quickly. And, uh, um, I, you know, and, you know, and, you know, we, and also too, I just kind of learned that, you know, parody is tough to sustain, you know, and, and that at the end of the day, that's what that show was, is, you know, you had, you were, you were doing, I, I decided, you know, and I, and I am not sure that at that moment, I knew the connection between Art Spiegelman and Garbage Pail Kids, but, but I decided, you know, just looking at the material, we ought to do it like Mad Magazine. And it ought to be a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, you know, connect, you know, you know, short dramas that are all kind of connected. And that would be the way to do this project. Uh, and so yeah, and so that's what we did. It was a bunch of, you know, individual episodes uh, and it was it was parodies. And the idea was you. Yeah. And you know, kind of Rowan and Martin, too. So, I mean, you know, sometimes your, your team dictates the reality of your project, you know, and I knew Roby knew how to do, you know, that kind of stuff. So. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, we, you know, structured the show like, you know, is a bunch of little vignettes and, and, uh, you know, you know, we're off and running and it just, it just, you know, hit a snag at some point. I, I don't know how to describe it any other way. And, you know, uh, you know, Judy wasn't happy with it. We did it, you know, I, uh, and, you know, and I got fired and, uh, um, then the show ended up, it, it, you know, was, it was unairable, which sounds pretty bizarre when you think that it was a, an in-house production. Yeah, well, they did not air it. I mean, it was, it was, I don't, I don't know when and if it was ever aired on TV, but certainly not in that period. It was, uh, I, I know it came out as, as uh, DVDs like in 2012, but yes. it was under wraps for a long time. I think, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, Judy thought, you know, hey, look, we're, it's in-house, we can do whatever we want. And, ran into the realities that everybody else was running into with, you know, what, 
you know, what would play and what, you know, parents would get upset about and what, you know, politicians get upset about and so on. But anyway, it was just, it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was a botch. It was, it, you know, you were talking about when we, we first started, you know, you're talking about, you know, going through these periods where, you know, the ups and downs and all that. And that was, that was a down. However, literally Michael Chase Walker, same guy, had just by chance invited Linda and I to a party that night, which was a launch party for some new comedian. And to this day, I don't know who it was, you know, and whether that person ever went on to have a big career or anything, but we went and that's where, uh, you know, you, you know, you've seen it in the book, you know, that's where I met Lisa Henson, who was saying, you know, and we're talking about, we're the whole time we're talking about Achilles, the shield and the Iliad. I'm quite mm-hmm. certain there was nobody else at that party that would, you know, would have been up for talking about Achilles, the shield and the Iliad, but that's what she wrote a thesis about. And uh, in, at Harvard, and uh, so, so uh, you know, met her and she said, hey, you know, we have an animation project. And, you know, that's one of the moments your whole career turns on. You know, and an animation project turned out to be Tiny Tunes. And then Linda is talking to some guy and it turned out that was uh, Charlie Fink who headed up uh, Disney Animation. And she walked, she came out of the party and had been offered Disney Babies, which is like the Disney version of Tiny Tunes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, it's just from going to the right party on the right night, which... We probably normally would have blown off, you know, but it just seemed like we ought to go, you know, because, you know, I just kind of had this instinct that, hey, garbage pail is not going to, you know, that that is really dicey. We better, you know, let's get out in the world and uh, and, uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, change our lives. But, yeah, that was uh, that's a that's a garbage pail story. So, yeah. So the show releases, you know, you know, doesn't release. They finish producing it. Uh, you know, nobody was really talking about it and, and I'm gone and then, you know, sold, uh, you know, um, you know, pitched tiny tunes to uh, Steven and he bought it and literally the same phone message. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, you had the old phone answering machines that had tape and I'd go, Dude! you know, so it's first Judy price, you know, you know, saying, look, this isn't working out, you know, but she'd been to lunch, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, then the next one says, hey, Steve Spielberg, look, you know, I just, uh, heard your pitch, you know, took Bobby and I forever to figure, I didn't know who Bobby was at that moment. And it sounded like on my tape that said Steve Spielberg, which he, nobody ever referred to him as Steve Spielberg. So probably something wrong with my answering machine, but, um, uh, uh, you know, but Bobby was, uh, uh, Robert Zemeckis and they do their, they had just figured out to use the Acme company in, in Roger Rabbit. And so it, I walked in, the Acme company was centered on my pitch, right? Because I didn't know, I was driving over there. I mean, for the two days before I'm cramming, I'm driving over there talking to Gordon Kent, you know, who knew all this stuff, you know, and saying, okay, let me make sure I got this straight. So Bugs, Daffy, Tasmanian Devil, Goofy's Disney, right? You know, all these are Warners and Disney, you know, and there were some, like, I'd never heard of Foghorn Leghorn, I don't think. Um, you know, so I was woefully uninformed in that crowd. I mean, yeah, uh, I but I did get this idea that what would happen was that finally, uh, Wiley Cody captured Roadrunner, caught Roadrunner, right? And he ate him, you know, and you, get, you finally get to see what you always want to see, right? And uh, then what you see is this gear going down his throat. And, you know, he spits it out and it says Acme Company on it. He realizes the Roadrunner was made for no other reason to sell him all this other crap and uh you know all these other acne products you know that he was the road I mean, road runners and felt self an acne product and uh you know they thought that was funny and bought it and in the meeting was the you know bettina who had been the champion of agent 13 right she was the story editor amlin then so i mean i was i was you know i was working a you know uh uh you know a, a friendly house and uh um, you know, it, it went through amazingly quickly and all of a sudden I'm doing that and, you know, and, uh, the, uh, you know, Waterloo at garbage pail kids was long since forgotten. And at that moment I was still finishing up visionaries, which may have been, I, have you ever seen visionaries? Oh yeah. I used to, I was thinking that. What? You know, this book makes me want to go to eBay and like buy some toys. Uh, visionaries was probably the, the holograms. Most cool. What? I love the little holograms. On well, there. yeah, I mean, the actual manifestation of the That's toy was a little bit goofy, but I mean, it was an interesting idea, but it was certainly the most polished show and best animated show we ever did. It was TMS and they were really good. And, mm-hmm. uh, but the toy line had been canceled before the show even aired. You know, that was, uh, you know, that, you know, 
what nobody knew and kind of the, the hidden factor was, was Stephen Hassenfeld was, you know, was sick. He had AIDS and, you know, AIDS was a very different thing then than it is now. And, and, uh, so a lot of the things that, you know, we didn't understand why they were happening, you know, now you, you know, you kind of, oh, that's it. That's what it was. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, Knights of the Mist- Knights of the uh, the Mystical Light, um, yes, mystical, whatever it was, Mystical Knights of the Magical Light, or what? <laughs> yeah. Probably had twelve different names, but yeah. So that was, you know, that was uh, the last show of. I, I would argue it was the last show of G One. Now that that you know, I'm sure blood has been spilled over that, so you know, you know, believe me if you want to. But that, that that would be my my argument, you know, because when you know when when Visionaries was over, you know, uh, you know, it's just we were uh, the the world moved on, and Deke was doing GI Joe and Transformers, and you know that just wasn't the same. I mean, nothing, you know, some of the names and people overlapped, and I tried to help people get work because you know I was I was writing movies at that point, but you know it, uh, you know some of the people, the writers who when the anime, you know, the, the, uh, Saturday, uh, you know, the syndicated stuff dried up, you know, a lot of people are just kind of, you know, la- you know, you know, high and dry. And so, you know, we, we, you know, I did some of that stuff, but I never had any interest after Sunbow and in actually working on, you know, Joe or trans. I mean, you know, it's like, it was a great experience. I was done, you know, it literally moved on, you know, with my life and, and, you know, and, uh, you know, the world moved on. So that was kind of the end of that. Tell you one thing, this book does a great job of capturing that the sort of chaos. Like, how do how do you embrace the chaos? I mean, you, you certainly have lived that. Yeah, well, I mean, you just you know, I mean, what's really funny? I mean, you you, you know, at that moment, I was young and didn't know any better. I mean, and, you know, I didn't know there were yeah, and and you don't know. There's all the stuff you don't know. You don't know that this is only going to last for a little while. You don't know whether this is going to be the rest of your life. You don't know how weird and abnormal the times are you find yourself in. Mm-hmm. And, and so you're, you're reacting on a day-to-day basis, but, you know, at some point you're also, you know, you're also kind of, you know, reading the tea leaves and it's like, uh, you know, yeah, this, this, this era is ending time to go find out what the next is. And, and, you know, and one of the, you know, a lot of cases, it's just simply getting lucky. Yeah. I mean, luck is a factor and it cuts both ways. You know, you have, you know, lucky times and not lucky times. And that was, you know, there were, there was a lot of luck all chained again you know next to each other at that moment you know and uh you know you go to the right party on the right night and everything changes i mean that's you know that's not it may be divine intervention or something but it's certainly not uh you know caused by me lucky roll the d4 yeah uh, it was you know yeah sometimes you just you know you get the lucky roll yeah you, know, you roll the d4 and you get you know you get one four times in a row and you know and and uh you know, that happens or you get four, you know, four times in a row, you know, it's just styrals. Well, I sure appreciate you taking all this time. I- well, no, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's a perfect day to be doing it because I'm just kind of like, you know, sort of it's like Saturday. I'm not doing anything. I was teaching a class. Yeah, maybe, we should have been That's watching it. cartoons this morning. Flint. What happened? Yeah, I could have been watching. <laughs> car- well, there, I mean, that is a bummer. And you're right. You lose something. The minute there weren't Saturday morning cartoons anymore. You know what I mean? Because I mean, all the the old structures that we've broken had an, a, you know the the effect you know of of focusing us, right? You know what I mean? You know that you know you were focused on Saturday morning. Everybody was watching the same thing, so yeah. everybody could talk about the same thing. And once you don't have Saturday morning cartoons, now it's just you know it's scattered all over the place. And so yeah, we you know you get something, you lose something. You know. That's, that's my that's my whiny uh, summary for today. Well, you say you've always got you should your advice to people is to always have a, have three irons in the fire. Yes, yeah, uh, and, you uh, know. So I got to ask you right now, what are your? Well, okay, that, that's because I'm in a really interesting moment right now, and that is, um, uh, yeah, I was doing a project. It was a launch title for uh, you know for Sony, and that ended. You know, I finished my part of it, and. Uh, I, you know, I, I obviously can't say what it is, but, you know, we'll see what, what its fate is. You know, I honestly don't know. Um, and I was doing that. And then I was uh, doing a uh, project for, for DARPA. And, you know, and that's, you know, that, that's over. 
And, and at some point I just decided, and, you know, it, you know, you're waiting around for things to happen, but at some point I just decided, you know, there are 5,000 things. Well, I mean, that's, it's another whole conversation, but over COVID I, I had to clean out my storage area. Mm-hmm. And what I found in the storage area is 40 years of stuff. Okay. And like, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of it's stuff that, that uh, JZP later put on eBay. Cause like, yeah, I mean, you'll notice there's no geek stuff in sight here. Uh, yeah, my wife does not, you know, that, that stuff is not going up in this house. But anyway, so, uh, um, you know, the, uh, you know, so I found a bunch of these old projects that I'd always meant to do. And a lot of them are like still good. And, and so everything I'm doing now at the moment that, you know, is an official project or something I can talk about is um, something I've been meaning to do since, you know, probably, I mean, some of them are projects that were, you know, date around Sunbow times, you know, there were like good ideas, you know, Nina Han called, she was a, a, a later executive at, at, uh, at Sunbow. Lena Han called and said, hey, whatever happened to Ben and the, you know, the Miniman? And I said, oh, yeah, I, I think I found that file. And I, it took me about weeks to find it. But I, you know, I was spending, I, I cleaned out all the stuff during COVID, but I didn't organize it very well. You know, because it was two months of like, you know, moving boxes, right? And we had, you know, structural problems with the storage area. So the contractors had to come in and they had to rebuild it. Anyway, um, and uh uh, so I, you know, that's what I'm doing right now, you know, and, and I, you know, I have everything from a thing to Paul Dini and I, you know, who Paul Dini is. Uh, it comes up in the book a couple of times. Yeah. Well, Paul Dini later would go on and do all the Batman shows, you know, the uh, animated Batman shows. Oh, and the, sure. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. No, he's, yeah. You know, some people argue that's the best iteration of Batman anybody's done. And, uh, um, you know, and, you know, he's still doing a Batman comic. I think he just finished his last one. Uh, but we, we came up with a thing around the time we were working at Lucasfilm, but not exactly then. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, he, uh, he's called, uh, called well, I can't tell you what it's called. He's, he's made me, I, I tend to tell everybody everything and Paul, you know, it's like one more. But anyway, uh, so we're, we're, we finally decided, I said, okay, Paul, let's do it. And I figured out a really good game mechanic. So we're doing it as a board game, which is another medium I'm really, I really want to, I, I want to work in again. You know, so, I mean, yeah, I'm doing a design in that as a board game. Uh, I told you about, you know, the thing I was talking to Rob Fulop about earlier, the, uh, the uh, wine tasting game. Yeah, I don't know. Is there room in the world for a wine tasting game? I don't know. But, it, yeah, you know, it's, it seems like kind of a goofy game to me anyway. So, you know. Let's try it out. So I play tested that. It would be a great party game, that's for sure. Well, that's exactly what it is. It is a casual social game where you're wine tasting and and you get, uh, you know, know, well, uh, there are a lot of wrinkles to it. But anyway, so um, so I'm working on that. What else am I working on? Um, Oh, yeah, a a project I can't talk much about, but you will very much like uh, when and if it comes to fruition. It's kind of the main thing. And that's a, a, once again, from back in the day, uh, based on uh, something Luke and Gary and I were messing around with back in the 80s. And uh, it's now coming out as a, uh, it could be a crossover between two very major franchises. That's all I can tell you. Mm-hmm. But things we've talked, both of which we've talked about. That's, that's my clue. Uh, but, I, but once again, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to stifling myself. Um, uh, so we're, uh, we're, uh, you know, we're working on that and, uh, um, that project where you had the dinosaurs and the, it's like four or five things mixed together. Yeah. Yes. You know, this, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of things in this. Yes. It sounded really cool. Yep. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So that, you know, that, so yeah, I mean, that, I mean okay. So of having vi- I'm now in the process of violating my own rule about I don't have like you know that you know the the five you know uh, you know totally legit real projects going right now that you know that, that's just not what's happening right now and uh but it is a chance to do all that stuff that I've been meaning to do for decades and hadn't really done it so you know we'll see what happens it, I mean, it's and it, it, it's its own kind of like you know scary endeavor because it's much better to be able to say you know I'm doing this big swanky famous prestigious project. It's like no, I'm just doing all the stuff I wanted to do. Is a weird thing to say. 
Sounds fun to me. Well, again. But that's where we are. Keep okay. Posting. Maybe we could do this again. I, I'm more than happy to. It's been actually a lot of fun. The surface of this. I mean, I know, it, I don't know. Uh, how long we no, there, no, there's a lot more stuff. And what it really impresses me, what's great about this is you'd actually like read the book and thought about it. And you happen to be interested in the stuff I'm interested in. <laughs> you know, you didn't ask me about killing Optimus Prime. You know, I kind of told that story a lot, you know, and, and, you know, and you kind of dug down to that, you know, that third level of question, which is, you know, which is kind of the whole point of why I was, you know, writing the book. Uh, you know, not to, you know, necessarily just tell, you know, fan stories, but, you know, I was, I, it was really just about an era, you know, and you really drew a lot of that out, um, which is, uh, you know, impressive because, you know, I, you, you talked about it a lot. That's why we ended up going for hours just because we were talking about the parts of it that interest me, which I mean, like, you yeah, know, nobody, nobody really thinks about that, but you, you ever interview something they're kind of bored with, what, you know, with talking, talking about this. whatever it is they're supposed to be talking about. You know, I was thinking that you're, I've probably better prepared to interview you than I've ever been with anybody just because you wrote the book and actually had a book to read. Yes. You yeah. Know, well, that, in that, you know, that the was, time, the, I'm just like looking at Wikipedia and there's just not, not a whole lot out there to. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's why it's a really good thing to go from, you know, the only, the, the only danger is you're going to run into some writer who by the time you're interviewing about their book, is like so sick of their book. But I'm really not, and especially, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not sick of the aspects of it that, that you and I were talking about. I mean, that's what kind of still interests me about the whole thing, the whole thing, you know, um, you know, it's, yeah, and, and so, uh, you know, yeah, it works out about perfectly. Well, that's the impression that I get from the book is that you're as much of a fan. Yeah. You know, as the reader, the somebody that really loved G.I. Joe, Transformers, all that, I mean, they're going to like this. It's not like you're taking a cynical view or something. Oh, no, 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 no. The whole purpose was exactly, you know, I mean, if there was a higher purpose, it was, I would love to figure out how to manufacture periods like that. Because it was just, just so, uh, you know, I, it, it was so, everything about it was serendipitous. And, it, you know, it was, it was kind of so good natured. And, it, you know, I, I would imagine for a lot of the people there, this may or may not be true of me, but for a lot of people there, it was kind of the high point of their life. It certainly was, you know, for a lot of people, the the most, you know, you know, lucrative and productive period of their career. But, uh, you know, I, I, I also believe there are a lot of people where it was just like, what a great, you know, time that was. And, you know, and let, you know, let's go like celebrate it and talk about it and figure out how, how, I mean, I haven't figured out how you go out and create that, but I would sure love to. Because it was just, it was just, you know, and, and a lot of it's serendipity and where you find yourself, but it's also what you do with opportunities that come your direction too. Hmm. Well, if we can crack that nut, we'll be somewhere. I know. Yeah, they crack, they crack the puzzle of eternal happiness. Well, there's certainly times and points, you know, in the computer game world that you see that, like there's a high point of Sierra. There's a, it's yeah. where, you know, when Carmack or Romero, wouldn't you love to be in there? I yeah, well, that's a, yeah, player. well, that's the whole thing. You the whole know? thing with Atari and Bushnell, you know, and it, that. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny is I, you know, I know his son uh, pretty well, and he's doing uh, Brent Bushnell, and uh, he's doing uh, Two Bit Circus in L.A. And he's, it's great stuff. I mean, it's a physical location, and it, you know, it is its own thing, but it it brings back a little bit of the feeling of of just that period, you know, when, you know, when his father was doing, you know, every, I mean, that, that was the other thing about the period. And I, I tried to capture, it. I don't know that I did, but, you know, it's like every time you turn, you open your eyes, you know, you, it was like some new magic object that arrived in the world. You know, I mean, you, you know, these weird little machines that would do, you know, you know, you know, do esoteric things, you know, these, you know, you get, you get the game boy was kind of the, the pinnacle of it, but, um, but I mean, even before then, there were just all these little like handheld computer game things that were just, you know, any one of them was just, you know, like great. Um, they just appear and a lot of them were, uh, you know, were Atari. And, you know, I mean, Atari had a real magic to it. You know, I mean, that, 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 you know, was no small part of the engine that powered the magic of the entire period. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, those are, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it's a, you know, the, yeah, you want that period back, you know, and, and also too, you know, working on games now, and this is, all right, this is real old guy speak. Okay. So I, and, and you know, I'll, I'll just <laughs> okay. tell you that ahead of time. 
just so you, you, you won't be like thinking and thinking, I don't know it, I know it. But, but I'm saying it anyway, and that is that it, what was, what was magic about that. And you, you, I try to, you know, I try to, you know, get, you know, students and things like that to do is, is imagine there's never been a video game. Cause now, you know, half your conversation remind you of Hollywood, you know, movie conversations, which are, yeah. And you, you know, it's a little bit like X meets Y meets Z. And it's like, what, one thing, the reason all the magic stuff happened is there was nothing to be imitating. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, uh, you know, there was there, you know, there weren't games out there. People hadn't made 500 of them. Uh, and, and I remember we'd have these conversations, you know, they're easy to mock after the fact, you know, you know, by, you know, and I mocked them myself, but I also understood the value of them. And that was, you know, well, what, what exactly is fun? I mean, you, you'd have perfect, some of the most intelligent people I've ever met seriously having that conversation and, and for the right reasons. Because, you know, we didn't know exactly. I mean, you're trying to quantify it. You didn't, it was not a mature business where there, and, and I, I think one of the secrets to, you know, to doing really exciting new stuff is to approach it like, you know, it's all new. You know, it's now so much is, you know, is, you know, kind of, you know, there, there's so many games out there and there's so many references. And the easiest thing to do is always to compare yourself to something else as opposed to, you know, just do something new. Well, there's a part of it and it's very hard to prompt just what there's a part of the book i think is really pertains to this and it's something i hadn't thought about until i read it but again to come back to music you know you were talking about how in the six listen to an album or song from the 50s or the 60s and how all the wait was this i'm thinking i hope this is in the book <laughs> yeah no what is it yeah Maybe I'm thinking of something completely different. No, maybe not. Just to keep going. Uh, but, you know, the idea was they had to show up in the studio and they had to actually perform the songs. Oh, yeah. No, that's in the book. the album. Okay. So I'm, I, this is in the book, right? Okay. Yes. This, <laughs> you this, know, this is they were the all in the studio. They're this all. Isn't, yeah, you haven't confused us with some other book. No, that, they this, have that to is perform the it. And there's something about that magic capturing that versus nowadays when you might have a guy come in like your bass you know you come in record the bass part one day the drummer comes in the next day and yes I think maybe covid might have even blown this up ten thousand times you know, ten thousand times and it's part of you know you get the impression that the musicians might not even know each other you know what i mean and that that's not how you create a lot of romance and legend and all yeah, that stuff a I lot mean. of because all these moments we're talking about like with you and gary and uh you know, they all happen if physically you're there you're in person it's just i think you call it like yeah. a mecca that, that, that happened no that, that i mean that was the magic and it was so much about you know the weird collection of personalities that you had had together and it all being you know ending up more than the sum of the parts you know which is you know that that that's when the magic happens and it happened you know i think a lot of the magic in life just happens in garbage time you know and, and, you know and and uh, i mean my family gets offended when I call it that, but my, my daughter was talking about, she, she, uh, she's a painter and she got into uh, new American artists and was kind enough to a new American painters um, or paintings or I can't remember what it's called, but anyway. Uh, and so they were writing a thing about her and uh, she was, she was crediting me, you know, maybe erroneously, but I was flattered, you know, for, you know, yeah, a lot of these were ideas we had, you know, that came and then my style came from, you know, yeah, sitting around with my father looking at paintings, you know, and making up ridiculous stories about them. And what that really was, was, you know, we'd be, you know, we'd wake up in the morning because she and I tended to wake up before anybody else. And, you know, we couldn't make any noise. We couldn't do anything. So we'd just be sitting in the living room and, you know, you know, my mother's place or one of the numerous kind of spooky old places that, you know, my family had. And, uh, and just looking at art, you know, and which, you know, be kind of, you know, scary stuff. And, uh, or not scary, but I mean, it was just, you know, and, and just making up stories, you know, and I'd be saying, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a nice painting of a, you know, of a lake, but, you know, it's not really about the lake and, you know, about the, the uh, uh, giant squid underneath the surface, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> she just went with it. But what the point was, the, you know, that's, that's what I was calling garbage time in that, you know, it's time when, you know, it's John Lennon's thing about, you know, life's what happens when you're busy making other plans. You know, that that's kind of what it is, you know, is, is, you know, and that's what you had back then that you don't have as much now for, and I'm not sure why, but I, we could figure it out, but you don't have, you know, quite the same kind of garbage time. 
You know, I mean, everything is so scheduled and, and so little is random. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, and you're constantly distracted. I mean, you know, the biggest aid there is creativity, as far as I'm concerned, is boredom. You know, you're sitting around kind of bored, staring at the walls and all that. You, you start getting ideas. And now there's some, you're, it's a constant distraction, almost like, I mean, the paranoid part of me thinks that, you know, it's, it's you know, people are, are deliberately trying to sap the creative creativity out of this culture by keeping us con- constantly kind of distracted and, you know, just weirdly mentally drugged by just garbage, you know, I, you know, social media and messages about nothing. And I realize that's also old guy stuff, but, but it's not entirely invalid either. You know, that, yeah, I mean, it's just hard to like, you know, focus on anything. Have you, you know? ever watched that show, uh, Alone? It's called Alone. No, what's Alone? I don't know what that is. It's these, uh, it's kind of one of these survival reality shows, but they, they send, they get a bunch of people and they separate them and they, you're basically alone in the woods trying to survive for. Right. Like, so anyway, I bring it up because it's, it's funny how you, these people after about the first week or so, if you're lucky, Maybe they'll go a week and then they're just going to start complaining and whining. And it's like, oh, I wish I had this. Oh, I missed this and I missed that. But I've watched like, you know, probably seven seasons of that show. Wow. Never once, not a single time, you know, have I heard, have I heard somebody say, man, I wish I had my cell phone with me. I know, I know. I wish I missed Twitter. I miss Facebook. You know, they never say that. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. I mean, think about that, you know, because I think it's true. But here's the insidious thing is we all, we don't have the infrastructure anymore to not use it. In other words, you know, we, I, you, you know, you can't, you know, we don't have phone booths everywhere. Because I mean, I've given a lot of thought to, I was watching uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I was rewatching that. And I realized <laughs> part of the magic, you, you remember yeah. that? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, I just love that film. And part of the magic of that film was that it was that, you're watching Brad Pitt drive around LA and it feels like the world used to feel, you know, he's just driving in his car and you felt very close to the world. I mean, you, you know, and obviously, you know, that was part of the brilliance of Quentin Tarantino making it, but, you know, at, at another level, it was, you know, he's like, you know, yeah, you used to be driving down the street and you're in the car and, and you're aware of the people on the street near you and you didn't have 16 buzzers, you know, you know, you know, you know, grinding, you know, you, you know, you didn't have any of that, you know, the, the distraction you just had, um, you know, you were, you were just aware of your immediate environment. It was really great. And, and, you know, and we didn't notice that leaving, you know what I mean? I, I mean, I didn't notice it leaving all of a sudden I saw it in a movie and I realized, yeah, stuff's missing. You know, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I don't have, I don't feel that way about the world. I don't feel connected to it the same way i used to you know and and you know that's because we have just such a you know a panoply of technological you know you know armor around us and and you know that it, it's 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 yeah. we're not we're not touching anything anymore you know i was just thinking we were talking a little bit about the COVID and the you know the everybody's zooming you know still you know there, there's some calls like we need to get back to the office because of these kind of moments we're talking about like you might just take it be taking the elevator up. It just so happens somebody comes on the elevator with you and you're having this conversation. But yeah, you run that, into that part it is you probably wouldn't happen because both of you would probably be looking at your phone the whole time. Now, that's the whole point. The whole point is yeah, we we have you know humans are are kind of you know nervous, you know, you know, in some ways, you know, or you know, some I'm sure it's different for different people, but in some ways, kind of shy you know, you know, creatures, you know, and, and so yeah, it's very hard to, you know, talk to and relate to people, you know, I mean, you know, and there's so much concern at this exact same moment in history, I would note that, you know, that we're talking about this, there's so much concern about, you know, you know, weird, creepy people, you know, you know, trying to talk to you and stuff like that, that we're sort of afraid of each other, we're sort of alienated from each other, well, you know, we're, you know, and, and that's not doing us a lot of good. You know what I mean? The sort of the fearfulness of it and the, you know, the alienation is, is really just getting worse. And, and, you know, we got a lot now I want, I want some stuff back and I don't know how you get it back. Yeah. That's probably the reason why there's, we 
started off talking about this the how half of the country feels alienated from the the other half you know and yeah that is due just to not simply not talking not ever being in a situation where you're just talking to somebody no i mean Never well forbid, i mean might have a different view you know yeah well think about how how you know the you know the, basically you know, if view it as a science fiction film, not reality for a second. And that is the fact that all these people are locked in and they can't go out. They can't talk to people. And we can't walk around thinking, oh, it's some accident that we've got just this really just ugly cultural period right now where nobody's happy. You know, and and, you know, now I think I, I I'm, you know, the optimistic part of me that has to remain that way or, you know, you'd be smoking the pistol or something, you know, is, uh, you know, is um, thinking it feels that it's changing a, a feeling that we're somehow kind of slowly crawling out of it. And, and 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 we are we are heading to better times and people are realizing they have many less problems with you, with each other than they were led to believe. And, you know, I think. I think things are getting better and, and I think they're getting better quickly. And I think, you know, they'll, they'll, they're on the right trajectory because at a certain point, I think people want to be happy. You know, even if other people don't want you to be happy, you do want to be happy and you're just going to find ways of doing it. And I, and so this, you know, yeah, my hope is that this kind of gross period will, will, you know, kind of just burn itself out. Yeah, and it seems to be, but yes, there's, you know, there's, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, Oh, I was just, you know, I mean, just, you know, all you have all these, when you have all these things happen that kind of reinforce the the same themes to you, you mm -hmm. can't not notice it. And, you know, it, it was just this, this general theme of, you know, people don't feel connected and they, and they feel alienated and there's, yeah, I think, I think the, you know, just the constant nonstop ambient ill-defined anger is coming to an end just because people don't want to hear it anymore. Sooner or later, nobody, you know, nobody wants to be around you if you're a big depressing downer. I mean, they just don't. And I think, you know, people are realizing, oh, you know, I have karmic BO. I got to stop this. Uh, you know, and a lot of a lot of hope always have the hope in the next generations and the, the kids, you know. Oh, yeah. Like, we, yeah, but I mean, it's you know, how the kids are not nearly as stupid or, pro, you know, programmed as you think they are. Well, and, and, yeah, and there were whole. I remember what it was like when you were a kid. You know, you're not yeah. just buying all the BS. I mean, you could see through it. You, yeah, you 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 usually could, but uh, you know, I don't think. Uh, I mean, we didn't have you know uh, you know uh, you know BS salesmen that were nearly as capable as the BS salesmen we have nowadays. I mean, we had you know. I just and, I doubt that I doubt that the whatever generation it is is going to grow up and say I want to be just like my parents. <laughs> no, uh, no. But what's really funny is, I, you know, I, I mean, it was, I was on a panel with a music guy, you know, some guy from the music industry. It's a long time ago, but it was something that never left my head. And he was saying, you know, what we got to get used to is the idea, you know, the idea that the world is is driven by a generation gap. That's a baby boomer idea. That is not the way it really is. And and that's the flip side of all this is that. Like my kids are are acutely aware of my cultural influences, you know, simply because it's all available. You know, I mean, it was kind of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, a friend of ours sent us a video and it was a Florence of Florence and the Machine singing Wild Horses with the Rolling Stones. I said, that's pretty amazing. Like, you know, I mean, that's a that's a 50 year old song. And, you know, I mean, and she knows it. My daughter looks at me and says, Dad, everybody knows wild horses. Okay, you know, and, and I realized, wow. Mm. Okay, they live in a generation where it's not separated from them. In other words, you know, you know, it's, you know, well, like, I, you know, I wouldn't didn't know 50 year old songs because where would I have heard them? You know what I mean? That That's wasn't, you know, I couldn't go to the, you know, the record store and buy 50 year old albums. It just, you know, distribution didn't work that way. I remember no, my dad was yeah. all the time telling me that, oh, I wish you could have watched Johnny Quest. You would have loved Johnny Quest, but, you know, there's absolutely no way for me to watch it. No way. You mean it's not on anywhere or not on? No, I mean, nowadays it would be accessible. Right, right. Yeah, no, kid, for you. There, if it didn't come on TV in a rerun or something, there was no yeah. way. No, the good news was that you had to, like, be there. You know, the bad news was you had to be there or run to the TV and catch it because it's only on this one time. And then it's going to, you know, reappear maybe in some mythical 
day in the summer, you know, and, and you'll be able to see it again if you don't catch it now. So there was an urgency and, and uh, you know, and a velocity to your doing it. You know, that was that, you know, and that that's, you know, something that we can a little bit miss. But what, you know, now you can't possibly miss it. But then there's no, you know, there's not the same cultural currency to it. You know what I mean? If, if you can get it any time, you know, is it as special? I don't, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I remember my, both my parents are big fans of the monkeys. Yep. You know, the TV show. And they're always telling me about it, me and my sister and I. And of course, there's no way we, I guess we could have bought like a tape or like heard occasionally you'd hear a song on the radio, but no idea what the show was about. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, unless it was running on syndication, you know, yeah. then you could see it. I remember but, like, it was like, like MTV or something one time had like a monkey's marathon and we we're like, hey, the whole family so excited. You know, oh, we kids can finally watch this. Well, I mean, it was it was a huge, a huge, you know, thing. What was interesting about it to me is I was working on a project. It's another one of these projects that I have to get back back on this one. I'm not actively working on it, but um, that that I'm I'm looking at now that it was basically set in that era, you know, with, uh, with the monkeys. And, you know, the premise of it was, uh, um, basically, you know, that they were doing spy work. Okay. Let me just put it that way. And I had a friend of mine who was actually there was a prominent producer who, who knows, you know, who is you know, very much of that era was just excoriating me for this is just crap. Nobody would ever, that would believe this. Then I see a monkeys episode. It is on now. Because I went out and found it, and totally by chance, the one I turned on was the goofy version of exactly my premise. And you know, and this was, you know, this was, uh, you know, um, Bob Rafelson. You don't get more New Hollywood than that. And then he was doing exactly what what I was talking about. And, you know, it's just I was, you know, putting it forth, you know, as a less goofy and less goofy version of it. And I realized, no, he's totally wrong. You know, my friend, yeah, he may be there. He may have, you know, you know, actually, you know, been at Woodstock. He may have all that. But the fact of the matter is, in that moment, the exact people who we're talking about were doing exactly what I'm saying they're doing. You know what I mean? It's, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, you know, it, you know, that, you know, memory changes things. All right. Throw me out of here. Um we're, yeah, uh, no, we got an optimistic note. Things are going to get better. I like that. They will. will and uh, we can do this again. We, uh, you know, find mm -hmm. some other some other questions. We'll do it. All you know, right. Well, again, yeah, thank you so one. much, Liz. It's been great talking and meeting you. It, it, it has been. It's been a, like, a really perfectly great way to spend the uh, morning. I have no idea whether anybody in the entire universe will want to watch it, but I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, maybe I can. Re maybe I repaid you somewhat for the Saturday mornings. <laughs> you, you sure did. <laughs> you sure did. Now this is fun stuff, and and we'll do further adventures when I when I come out with some of these projects. We can do those because not all of them are totally unrelated to what we're talking about. That's all for this week's episode. <laughs> you guys enjoyed that. Man, I wasn't kidding around now, was I? You know, Mr. Uh, Flynn, he's got something for everybody. And, and the funny thing is, I had a bunch more questions I didn't even get around to. So we've got a series about a, a part two here. Uh, of course, you really, in all seriousness, need to buy the guy's book. Uh, Games Master, the game author, I think it's called The Games Master, and some other stuff after a colon uh, but definitely check that out it's a great read it's one of those books too it's a uh, you, know, you can read a little bit here a little bit there uh you know kind of episodic <laughs> as it were <laughs> uh, but man so many good stories in that so many good quotes a lot of good advice you know i just, just highly highly recommend that book uh, and i'll put a link to it in the show notes of course well as always i want to thank you Yes, you. I see you there. <laughs> I want to thank you. Thank you for supporting the show, keeping Matt Chat on the air. I would not be here if it wasn't for people like you. You know, what kind of awesome person am I talking about? You're like, is he talking to me? Is he really talking to me? Well, I don't know. Have you taken the time to go to that link in the show notes, that Patreon link? You know what that is? Huh? You taking a few minutes to check that thing out? I think you should. <laughs> you really should. <laughs> You know, y'all want to 
uh, uh, to help you out here. You know, go check out the link. Uh, a couple of bucks a month, a buck or two, you know, whatever. You, you might go five bucks a month. You know, you know whatever you can afford to do. Uh, do uh, click on that, sign up, become a Retron, join the team, hop on the Discord. You're going to have a good time. You're going to meet good people. And you'll really, really have my, my gratitude for that. So thank you. 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 That's a new sign-ups uh, recently. I just, I just, I'm going to have to make sure I put those in the, in the credits, as well as Matt Bradley Shergy. <laughs> you know, I've mentioned, uh, mentioned him a couple of times. He's uh, you know, assisting me, associating with me, whatever you want to call him, helping me produce these episodes, helping me find people like Flint uh, to come on the show. So uh, thanks to Matt, too. He's doing a great job. All right. Let's see. We did the, the thank yous. Yes. Uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> What about the news from the Matt Cave? Oh, down here at the Matt Cave. You know what's in the news about RPGs? There's a game that came out, and everybody's talking about it. Uh, everybody's playing it. Everybody's asking me if I'm playing it. My mother-in-law's asking me if I played this thing. And you know, what do I think about it? Look, I haven't had a chance to play it. <laughs> you know, school starts in like a week, and I've done like zero prep. Okay, that's just between you and me. You know, yeah, I've been, I've been prepping all, all summer long. Sure. <laughs> so, like, I haven't had a chance. I, I install, purchased it and I installed it. You know, that, that's the limit. Uh, I'm strained to capacity uh, with this. But, man, yes, of course, I can't wait to dive into this. I'm trying to, you know, sorry if I don't get involved in discussions about it or anything. I'm trying to stay spoiler free until I get a chance to play it a little bit, see what it's all about. I, I really don't want to get like a you know, uh, a precondition or a, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, I don't want my uh, initial playthrough to be uh, tainted somewhat, <laughs> uh, either by positive or negative spin. You know, I just like to jump into a game, see what I think first, uh, and then maybe look at some of the reviews, you know, see what other people are saying about it. But man, I really, uh, this is kind of a special thing. <laughs> you know, I haven't even said the name of it. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's got enough, uh, enough hype. Uh, so I don't even want to say the name of the game because, I mean, uh, they, they're getting enough free publicity. No, I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> I hope uh, you know what you know. So don't, don't even tell me about what you think about the game. yet. I want to go in fresh, fresh as the driven snow into Baldur's Gate 3. When I do get around to balding, I will let you know. Wait, is that the way? I don't know if I like the way that sounded, but... <laughs> Anyway, I did purchase it, and I have it installed. It's sitting in my Steam library. It's teasing me. It's just there. It's just there. All right, moving on. Justin Carter of Gizmodo. Is it Gizmodo or Gizmondo? I have uh, Gizmodo here. You remember that game, Magic the Gathering? It's kind of funny. We're just talking about it. There's a funny meme going on around about it in the Black Lotus card. But anyway, there is some actual news about this. They're, they're adding some new cards, new themes, and one of them is Fallout. So they got Fallout cards, Final Fantasy cards, and uh, there's one other, Assassin's Creed. Uh, so they're kind of borrowing some of the uh, video game stuff and putting it into the card game. They say, the uh, talking here about the uh, Fallout ones, they say want, they want to bring the Wasteland's many colorful factions to Magic the Gathering so that players can recreate some of Fallout's most famous and outlandish moments. Uh, so there you go. Some folks will be <laughs> excited about that. I, I don't know. Uh, it's been a long time since I played Magic the Gathering, uh, but who knows? You know, it would, it'd be kind of cool. They do have good artwork on, on the cards. It might be worth looking into that if you are a serious Fallout collector or those uh, those other games. Uh, and then lastly, if you, uh, for whatever reason, don't want to play Baldur's Gate 3, and you, but you still want to play some uh, new RPG, you might check out uh, Holiday. This is a game for the Commodore Amiga computer, written by one Life School 22, a friend of the show, is <laughs> his personal friend. Or, I know the guy a little bit. We talked uh, off and on on uh, the interwebs. Let's see, the creator, uh, which is Life School 22. What's his other name? I think he goes by something else um, uh, in other forums. But anyway. He says, uh, this is a game where your task is to survive the next 11 days in a climate of heat, humidity, and the air smelling sweet like ripe bananas, <laughs> like ripe bananas, <laughs> at a Spanish resort. And he's used a product called Can Do. You might recognize that name if you're an 
old time Amiga fanatic. Uh, kind of like Hypercard. I've never played with Hypercard or can do, but my impression is, my uninformed opinion is, they're kind of similar in terms of, uh, I guess, concept. But anyway, it looks kind of cool. It's got the uh, photo realistic images or actual photographs digitized uh, for the game. So this this looks about as different as you could possibly get from BG3. So <laughs> if you need a break, <laughs> uh, check it out. I think it's just kind of a, a fun project. You might uh, enjoy kicking it around a little bit. All right, how about that ale of the week? What about that ale? What about that ale? Oh, what the ale? <laughs> oh, what have I got here? It's a athletic brewing company. You know. <laughs> You know, a lot of people, they, they don't like drinking beer. They, they're kind of afraid of beer. They're like, I don't want to get, like, the beer belly. You know, I don't want to be woozy, you know, that sort of thing. I want to stay in top physical form. I want to stay physically and mentally alert at all times. But, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want to just drink water. You know, I don't want to drink a Coke. You know, I want, I want something cool. Uh, so that's what these guys are trying to tap into, uh, the Athletic Brewing Company. Let's see what they say. It's a non-alcoholic. It's a little bit misleading. It's not no alcohol. It's a very little bit. I think it's uh, less than 0.5%. So, man, you'd really have to drink a bunch of these. <laughs> You're probably not going to get drunk even if you chug like six of these things, uh, which might be fun to, fun to try that out sometime. But, but no, that's not the point. You know, the point is you can just sip on this and not have to worry about all the side effects of a regular brewski. But idea being it still tastes just as good you won't you won't notice the uh the uh, process let's see if they say anything else i'm trying to figure out where this these guys are from let's see at athletic brewing company we are pioneering a craft brew revolution we believe you shouldn't have to sacrifice your ability to be at your best to enjoy great brews so we created our innovative lineup of refreshing non-alcoholic craft brews you know this is a really one you could be working out in the gym you know and swigging on these or <laughs> <laughs> in class, you know, I've heard some people even giving these to kids. I don't, I don't know what, how I feel about that, you know, because it does have a little bit of a, it's not completely alcohol free. Let's see, water, malted barley, wheat, hops, and yeast. You know, I don't know if they have a good idea if you tried to buy one of these in the store. You know how that works. Where are they from? San Diego, California. And it's supposed to be a free wave, free wave hazy IPA. Uh, so anyway, let's get the sucker open, see what it's all about. Athletics. See, the more of these you drink, the buffer you get. I mean, it's, it's really magical how that works. You know, you've probably been like hitting the, hitting the gym, doing push-ups and sit-ups and chin-ups, and all you really ever had to do was just pop open a can of Athletic Brewing Company. Yes, I'll have the Athletic. Pretty clever marketing you know, to call it Athletic because it's like... So if you're not drinking this, you're drinking like the non-athletic. <laughs> well, let me see. I'll pour some in the drinking horn, too. Get even more athleticism. Oh, my goodness. You know, I feel kind of athletic. I got like the, it's just like a soccer shirt. <laughs> you know, I wore this in public today, this shirt. I was in Burlington Coat Factory, went to Dollar Tree, a couple of places, and I was getting some very strange looks from people. They like... I had to like do a double take. Like, was that some team? Uh, some Autobots? <laughs> you know, I, I think they thought it was a legitimate uh, sports shirt, which is pretty cool. It should be. All right, let's give this the old. Uh, uh, very hoppy. You know, this definitely. You know, it's got that citrusy hoppy aroma. I really like that. Uh, you know, it definitely. It's. I don't know if you noticed this. I poured it into the glass, but it's got a nice head. It's nice and thick. Pours out just like a regular beer would. In no way does it look or, or smell watery. You know, I'll be damned. I mean, that smells exactly like, you know, just any other, you know, any uh, hazy. Well, I don't know if I could smell the haze, but, you know, if I didn't know anything and just like, here, try this, I'd just say, that smells like a good IPA to me. All right, let's, a little bit congested, but let's uh, see what it tastes like. Mm-mm. I feel like I lost five calories just in that one swig. You know, this is a... How to describe that? You definitely taste the hops. It's got a nice uh, a creamy texture to it. You know, obviously you don't taste like a <laughs> overpowering alcohol uh, fumes or anything like that coming off of this, which that would be 
Uh, you know, very false advertising if that were the case. Uh, but, you know, it tastes pretty good. Uh, let me try it again here. And again, when, I, when I'm drinking these non-alcoholics, I don't try to compare them directly to a, a regular IPA. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's really what they're going for. Uh, but I do ask myself, you know, would this be a good substitute? Uh, just, you know, for what it is, do I enjoy it, you know, compared to other uh, non-alcoholic brews? I try to do that kind of thing when I'm uh, ranking these. Uh, so let me give it an, another taste here. So this one, this one is close. You know, it's pretty close. Uh, again, I wish there was some way I could, like, do a blind taste test so I didn't know which one was the real uh, IPA versus the non-alcoholic ones. Because I might be a little bit... Uh, you know, uh, biased, I guess, after reading, or after knowing, with that knowledge, uh, uh, with knowing it's a non-alcoholic one, but, man, it's close. I'm going to try it one more time here. Hmm. Yeah, I think I could, I think I could, if I, if, <laughs> you know, if you put this up with another, with a regular IPA, and you told me that one of them was non-alcoholic, I, I feel like I could detect uh, which one it is. It's just a little bit lighter tasting. You know, it doesn't kind of have that sting uh, that you get with a, you know, especially some of the stronger IPAs, but that might not necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, but anyway, as far as an IPA uh, profile goes, it is uh, <clears throat> kind of citrusy, a little bit of, a little bit of bitterness. You know, I actually think, uh, and I noticed that with the last one that I tried too, I think these non-alcoholics, uh, they might want to up the bitter factor just a little bit more to really kind of give a little punch that way, uh, since you're not getting the uh, the alcohol punch. Uh, but it's not bad. It's smooth. Uh, again, I think the uh, idea of the athletic thing, you know, you're, you're drinking this, you might be working out and <laughs> drinking some of these, uh, you know, as you're working out, so you wouldn't want something too too heavy. You know, you want something that would uh, be hydrating, hydrating to some extent. Hmm. And see, I really like this. I, you know, this would be great if you wanted to, uh, you know, you're playing a D&D &D or something. <laughs> you're going to be playing for four or five hours. You want to be drinking some uh, some brew, but you don't want to get stupid. Uh, I think you really couldn't go wrong with this, uh, if that's the goal. This Athletic Brewing Company Free Wave Hazy IPA uh, tastes good. You know, I'm not going to say it's as good as my favorite IPAs. I mean, come on. <laughs> but I feel comfortable going maybe three out of five on this, uh, just across the bar. And I guarantee you, if you really like IPAs and I gave you this, I don't think you'd be disappointed. I <laughs> think you'd enjoy it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's really good. You know, I'm really getting uh, excited about these. Uh, you know, I want to go to the big liquor store in town and just buy, buy like, every kind of non-alcoholic beer they got. Uh, just so I can really kind of bone up on the, on the standards of quality with this. But you know, that is good. I would I would highly recommend this if you're looking for a... Uh, non-alcoholic non hazy IPA. <laughs> you know, go for the athletic, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, all right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking for quotes by Mr. T, one of my favorite uh, characters, I guess wrestlers. You know, I used to see him on, he's done a lot of stuff, hasn't he? You know, I, I mostly rem remember him from the A-Team. You know, we used to watch that show. Uh, remember that coming on as a kid, really liking the, you know, Pity the Fool, all that stuff. I mean, who doesn't like, I, I'm pretty sure Mr. Am I just imagining this? It was Mr. T a G.I. Joe at some point. Like he was, they had a figure for Mr. Am I just making that up? I don't know. Maybe it's that athletic uh, brewing company, the Hazy IPA getting to me. But anyway, he's got a lot of great quotations, a really fantastic uh, motivator, you probably know. Uh, but anyway, here's one of his quotes I thought I would share with you. And I'm not going to try to do his accent. <laughs> uh, but it goes something like this. To have a comeback, you have to have a setback. Some wisdom in that. So ponder on that and see you guys next time.
circuit sizzle. When are we gonna start busting Decepticops? <laughs> <laughs>